Hi everyone, thanks so much for listening to another episode of Dogman Encounters Radio. I'm Vic Cundiff and I'll be your host for the show. Before we bring on tonight's guest, if you've had a Dogman Encounter and would like to speak with me about it, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you. If you've had a Sasquatch sighting and would like to be a guest on Bigfoot Eyewitness Radio, please go to bigfooteyewitness.com and submit a report. All right, let's bring on tonight's guest. Since tonight's guest wishes to remain anonymous, I'm just going to call him Ryan on tonight's show. Ryan, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Vic. Well, thanks for being here. We appreciate your time. Ryan, please give us a brief bio on yourself. Well, uh, I'm from Alabama, central Alabama. Born and raised here. Just good old country guy, I guess. Uh, 40 years old. Four kids. Just really living the dream, man. Uh, been in ministry for about 20 years, uh, youth ministry, motivational speaking, things like that. Uh, also have a secular job that I do, um, in sales. So, uh, that and chasing my kids around, volleyball, basketball, things like that keeps us pretty busy. So, uh, being a full-time dad. So that's, yeah, it pretty much sums me up. Yeah. It sounds like you have carved out a really good life for yourself. I'm impressed. Ryan, you saw an interesting post on Facebook earlier today that might have been dogman related. Please expand on that for us. We live in a small town, like I told you earlier, probably about 2,500 people, give or take. And we have a community neighborhood watch that I'm a part of on Facebook that I follow. So I got home from work today and I'm scrolling through and I see this post and this lady's talking about she had let her dogs out around five o'clock this morning. And, uh, Talked about an underground fence and she's not worried about them being outside or anything like that. Said she had went back in and dozed off and was awakened by a lot of barking. So she gets up, she goes outside and she looks and there's her two dogs and two other dogs out in the yard and said that she sees this black thing just running off the hillside. And she said it was really too large to be a dog. She said maybe it was some sort of pig or old wild hog, which we do have in our area. Um, in our area, I'm going to say probably 15 miles from our area. There's a pretty good population, so I guess they could migrate this way. But either way, she said it was really big at the shoulders and just jet black, and it's running off. She did mention whenever she brought her dog inside that it had scratch marks on its body. Now, me being a hunter and growing up in the woods and, and just being around things like that, hogs don't scratch. You would have a puncture wound. At the very least, at the very most, some sort of laceration. The way their teeth are designed, they they move up and down. They constantly sharpen. They're like tusks, I guess you would call them. Um, so if that thing had gotten attacked by a hog, even a small hog, you know, a piglet, could do more damage than just a scratch, which I would assume dogman could too. But I'm reading this post, and I'm thinking, lady, if you only knew. <laughs> I mean, maybe it was a hog. I don't know, but I'm pretty sure I know what it was. And, and I don't think it was a pig. I don't think it was a dog. Not the quintessential dogs like we see every day, anyway. Well, gee, Ryan, if it wasn't a pig or a dog, I wonder, what could it be? You know, in my opinion, from things I've seen in my lifetime, I I don't want to say it was a dog man, but I'm, I'm pretty convinced it probably was. Just being the area we're in, I've lived here for 40 years of my life. And, uh, you know, back from when I was a kid up until now, I know what I've seen and I know what I've experienced. So, in my opinion, I think that's what she saw. I think sometimes in our minds we try to equate things that aren't as things that are, you know, things we're used to seeing, things we're things that we're used to uh, experiencing. And in my opinion, I think she just kind of associated what she saw with the dog or maybe a pig. But if you want my unprofessional, professional opinion, I say it's a dog man. Well, as you know, not everything that goes bump in the night is a dog man. But from the way you describe what she said she saw... It does make you wonder if that might have been what she saw. It's a good possibility. I want to ask your opinion on a subject that last week's guest Roy talked about. As I'm sure you know, a lot of people who listen to the show say they'd love to have a dogman encounter. Considering the fact that you've had so many dogman encounters, what are your thoughts on that? You really don't know what you're asking for. It's funny, I'm also on a, a research site. I don't know if I should say the name or not, but on Facebook. And a guy posted today, he was somewhere out in Arizona and they were going Sasquatch watching and he was hoping to see one and and maybe get a bluff charge. 
you don't want that. I, I've never had, I guess, a quote unquote bluff charge, but I know what I've seen. And if you've seen what I've seen, you don't ever want to see it again. I mean, it's, you, you can't unsee it. You know what I mean? It's, it's like driving up on a car wreck and somebody being cut in half. You, you, you just can't unsee that. So to go out searching for these things and, 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 you know, I don't know if Bigfoot's real. I, I've never seen one. You know, I, some experiences when we were younger, maybe possibly if, if it could have been a Sasquatch, could have been a dogman. I don't know, but I know what I've seen. As I've gotten older in life, and I can promise you this, I mean, maybe there's just guys out there that are a lot tougher than me. I don't do horror movies and things like that, but I don't do those things because of things I have seen in my life. And things in the movies, they just don't hold a candle to something standing there that your brain cannot process. Okay, this is not real. This is not This is not natural. This is not something that, that I should be seeing. This is something I see in the movies. Your brain can't process it, so... The whole time you're thinking, do I run? Do I stand? Do I fight? Do I cry? Do I, and you're going to do all those things, probably poop your pants, you know, all in the same motions. So, you know, seeing one, I, you know, you may think you want to see one and maybe you're just a tough guy and can handle it. But in my opinion, nah, I could, I could go the rest of my life without ever experiencing anything like that again. Oh, I can understand why you would say that. After the listeners have a chance to hear about all of your encounters, I'm pretty sure they're going to understand too. Speaking of that, you've got a lot of encounters to share with us tonight, so let's get to it. Please tell us about your encounters. Give us every last detail that comes to mind. Okay. Let's just start back when I was a kid. I grew up, my mom was a single mom. Uh, my dad split when I was a baby. Um, so we lived with my grandparents. My grandparents had a farm that's probably five miles or so from where I currently live now and currently where I grew up. And it wasn't a big farm and we had chickens. We had a couple of goats. We had horses. My grandfather was really into Tennessee walking horses. So we had several of those and they were also heavy equipment operators. So we experienced a lot of things. Like, you know, chickens coming up just dead in the yard, which you could equate to coyotes or even even dogs in the neighborhood. Um, chickens missing at times. The hens would, certain times of the year, they should be laying. They wouldn't. You could hear them at night, you know, just carrying on kind of crazy. We never really knew what it was. We just equate to, you know, coons or, or coyotes or possums or something like that. Some sort of predator maybe being around. My grandfather's equipment at times would have flattened tires or the wires that were exposed would be ripped or torn. Things like rocks thrown at the glass and, and then being busted, things like that happened. Um, there would be times at night, and I would tell my mom, she's like, oh, you're just hearing things. Um, but I would hear on the back deck footsteps, like two feet, heavy, you know, big man walking footsteps. So not really 100% sure what that was. Then one Christmas... This man beats on our door somewhere around midnight. My grandfather gets up, goes to the door, and there's a guy outside, and um, he's just begging my grandfather, can I please come in? Please let me in. And my grandfather's trying to assess the situation, trying to see what's going on. And he takes the look, takes a look at this man and realizes, hey, this guy probably needs some help. So, like I said, it's, it's Christmas Eve, going into Christmas Day. He brings this guy in and we all hear it and we all get up. We go in the living room and the man starts telling a story about how he was leaving a Christmas party and he was attacked by somebody in the woods. He's he's walking down the main road and I mean, it's just a two lane road and it's it's pretty heavily wooded on both sides. Houses are, you know, a minute or two drive apart. And he said as he's walking home, he was attacked by like the biggest man he had ever seen in his life and said um, the guy wasn't wearing a shirt. And said he was just extremely hairy. He said he could see skin through the hair, but he, he couldn't ever see his face or anything like that. He just said he was a big man. And then said all of a sudden, another man just kind of intervenes and starts fighting with this other man. And he, he's able to get away. And how he ends up at our house, I don't know, because you, you come off the main road and you turn down another road that's probably about a mile long. We lived about a quarter of a mile. We were the first house you would come to on that road. But he would walk through some, what we always called the holler, pretty heavily thick woods to get to our house. And, and it wouldn't have been hard to find our house, but if he was on the main road, why would he turn down our road? I guess he just thought, hey, there's probably got to be some houses down here. Maybe it was from the area. I don't know. But uh, 
in doing so, him telling us what happened, I began to look at this man, and he was clearly intoxicated. I mean, his speech is slurred. Uh, I remember, I didn't realize at the time it was the smell of alcohol, but as I got older, I, the more I thought about it, I was like, yeah, you could smell it on him. But his clothes were torn, he was bloody, and he was just panicked. I mean, he was freaking out. And uh, my grandmother was like, you know, you need to call the cops, you need to call the cops. So he called the law enforcement out, local sheriffs, and they came out. And uh, I remember as he's telling the story, one of the men said, oh, no, they're back. You know, one of the police officers, oh, no, they're back. And my grandfather was like, who's back? And he was like, it's not a big deal. Don't worry about it. Um, there's just been some vandalism in the area. There's been farm equipment tampered with. There's been livestock killed. And my grandfather chimed up and he was like, hey, that's happened to us. You know, we had a horse that was slaughtered. You go out one day. It's just laying there. He'd clearly been attacked by some sort of animal. And, you know, an, an animal that can bring down a horse is pretty large, you know. So, you know, I don't really know what my grandfather thought about it. He would never talk about it. My uncles were practical jokers. They liked to to scare us growing up. And, and that may be part of the reason why I was never really into horror movies and things like that. I mean, they would talk about werewolves and they would talk about Bigfoot and things like that and, and just try to spook us. And But they always told us, you know, these things aren't real. There's no There's no real reason to be afraid. But I honestly, in my heart of hearts, really think that my grandfather knew there was something out there more than than what he would even tell us. And and I for dang sure know that the guy that was beating on the door that night knew, you know, that that something else was out there. And and I'm not 100 percent sure he was convinced it was a man, but I think that maybe his mind could process that, that it had to be a man. It couldn't be anything else. But I didn't really put a lot of stock into that growing up. Up until I was about 14, we had some other instances that, you know, some things we saw, which I won't get into now, but my mom, my sister, and myself saw something one night and, and we could all three tell you the same story. Um, if it's not the exact same story, it would be pretty darn close. But when I was 14 years old, well, let me back up. My mom married my stepdad when I was about 10 and he was a, he was a farmer. He had cattle and, we had a, a pretty large farm. We kept about 200 cows on the pasture at all times, and, and that was just his trade. That's how he made his living. And uh, I had the unfortunate pleasure <laughs> of having to work every day of my life as a child on the farm, which it taught me a lot. It, it, it taught me the value of hard work. It taught me the value of a dollar. I'm not scared to get my hands dirty. He was very gruff, very tough, uh, very short. Uh, with me a lot of times, but what I, what I think he was trying to do was just trying to toughen me up, you know, um, trying to, you know, whenever you grow up with just your mom and your sister, there's not really any male influence in your life. And my, my grandfather, my, my uncle was there. Like I said, we lived there probably till I was about seven. Um, then we moved out, you know, there's a lot of influence there, but you don't have that male role model, that father figure in your life. There's a lot of things you don't know, things that, that maybe I should have known at that time in my life that I didn't, you know, how to cut grass and how to weed eat and things like that. And he was going to make sure come heck or high water that he was going to teach me those things. So like I said, we grew up on a farm and a lot of my daily chores were to not so much when I was 10, 11, 12, but about the time I hit 13, I was up when the sun came up. If not before I was dressed, I was at the barn. Um, I was crushing feed. I was putting out hay. Just whatever, you know, filling the tractor with fuel, whatever he needed, I basically done. Um, anything to make his life easier and his work easier is what I done. So when I was about 14, there was one afternoon and we did this daily. We would check that we would walk the fence line of the pasture. We did it every single day just to make sure there were no holes or tears or nothing had gotten out or nothing had slipped in, you know, nothing unusual. And if there were, we would fix it. But we're scrolling along one day and, and we see this pack of coyotes. Now, there were two distinct packs of coyotes from this day forward that I remember. One pack, there was probably six, seven, eight, um, and they were just your standard run-of-the-mill. And sometimes you would see all of them, sometimes you wouldn't, but they were just your standard run-of-the-mill, gray, brown, white coyotes. You know, 30, 40, 50 pounds, nothing major. They might kill a calf every now and then. They spent a lot of time next door to us. The guy next door to us had sheep, and I guess those were easier targets, but... They would spend a lot of time over there, and uh, if my stepdad got a chance, like he always had a gun with him, he always had his rifle with him, and uh, if he got a chance, he would pick one off. He would always, if he ever shot one, he would always take it and hang it up in a tree, which I don't know if this is a common thing. I've never heard of anybody else doing this. He 
he had a lot of weird quirks about him, but he would hang in a tree. And I remember asking him one time, we'll call him Pop for lack of better words. I said, Pop, why don't you hang that in the tree and, and just leave it like that? Isn't going to stink? Or he said, well, that's the point. And I was like, what do you mean it's the point? He said, well, when the others come around and they see one of their own hanging there, they'll know they don't need to mess around here. Something put it there. And by me shooting it, maybe they will see it. Maybe they'll know to stay away. So I just kind of took his word for it. I don't know if that's true or not. But uh, that particular day, we're walking the fence line, checking the fences, and we see a group of coyotes that are distinctly different. Now, maybe those six or seven had joined this pack. I don't know. But I do remember seeing them a couple different times in those separate groups, the, the six, seven, eight. And then there was a group of about 12 to 15 that were always together. Now in that group of 12 to 15, there were three that were distinctly, I mean, distinctly different. And one of those three was even more different than the other two. So your rest of your pack was your run of the mill coyotes, brown, gray, uh, white, you know, parts on them kind of mixed together, you know, 30, 40, 50 pounds. The other three were considerably larger. And when I say considerably larger, like if you, uh, they were bigger than wolves in my mind. You know, I mean, I don't know. I don't even know if that makes sense because in Alabama, we don't have wolves. My stepdad always said they were just big coyotes, that they were eating good. They, they eat off of us good is what he would say. He would say, uh, you know, people go to the store to buy groceries and steaks. Well, the coyotes come here to get their steaks. So, that's what he attributed to those three being so much bigger. Now, two, the two smaller ones were jet black. I mean, black as night. Like you couldn't, you couldn't get it any, any blacker. I, I, there's really not a word to describe. I mean, the darkest night you have, you probably wouldn't see them and you might not even see them on a full moon night because they're so dark. The other one probably outweighed Golly, I'm not really good with weights. Uh, it outweighed the other two considerably, and those two outweighed the rest of the pack considerably. The biggest one was dark gray, well, dark black with gray, like interwoven in its fur, for lack of better words. Like you could see, I, I don't know if you've ever, have you ever seen like a, somebody who's kind of salt and pepper, their hair is salt and pepper. That's how its fur looked. But it was, it was bigger and it was clearly the one in charge. The times I, I saw this pack come through, if it ever barked or howled, and it wasn't when it when it howled in the daylight, it wasn't anything uncommon or anything that would catch your attention. You would hear it and you'd say, "Yep, the coyotes are back." But when it it howled and the pack was around, all of them came to attention. It was so it was almost militaristic. Like they would just stop whatever it was they were doing. They would focus in on it. And then the two black ones would immediately go to its side. And it was almost, it was almost like they were lining up without lining up. I mean, you see a drill sergeant come in and, you know, a 10 hut and everybody stops what they're doing and they, they, they kind of get in a formation. Now, I'm not saying they, they got into straight lines or anything like that, but they stopped what they were doing. And the other two immediately went and stood beside what my stepdad called the alpha. Now, this particular day, the first time I had saw them, and he called me boy a lot. He said, boy, you see that pack of coyotes there? I said, yes, sir. He said, you can shoot any of them that you want, except for them three. And I was like, well, why not? And he said, just trust me, boy. I've dealt with these coyotes for many years. You don't want to mess with them three. And you would have to know my stepdad. He was about 20 years older than my mom. So he was in his 50s. He, he kind of grew up hard and he grew up in a time where, you know, Money was tight and you had to work and country living was country living. So he kind of reminded me of John Wayne, as funny as that may sound. <laughs> but he was very matter of fact, very straight to the point. He said, whatever you do, whatever you do, never shoot those three black ones. He says, as a matter of fact, I'd rather you not shoot at any in that pack, period. If you see them, you're by yourself. You keep your eye on those three and you back away and you make your way to the house. If I'm home, you let me know. I'll handle it. If I'm not home, you tell me when I get home, and if we see him again, I'll handle it. So, you know, at 14 years old, I wasn't one to really get into any trouble. I, I've, I've always been in my life very much um, kind of you do what you're told type person. Like, I follow the rules. Even as a teenager, I, you know, I, I did my dirt as a teenager, but I was always scared I was going to get in trouble or get caught or get hurt. So, you know, 
I was taught to respect my elders and listen to what my elders had to say. Um, if it wasn't something that was compromising morally or illegal, you listen to the, to your elders. That's just, that was instilled in me by my grandparents. And, and so it just, it kind of followed over with my stepdad. So I just took his word for it. Um, I didn't ask too many questions. I was just like, well, I really don't want to mess with these things anyway. They're freaking wild dogs. I don't, you know, I don't know what they'll do. If they can kill a cow, they can kill me. And the thing you got to understand is every time this pack came around, if it was, especially if it were at night, you, you knew they would kill large cattle, like, large cows, seven, eight hundred pounds. And and I guess maybe because the other three were so big, or maybe because and I'm trying to rationalize this in my mind as I'm telling this. I know how they killed them or why they killed them, but in in my mind maybe the pack was so large or those three were so large that they could take down a large cow to where the smaller pack can only take a calf or the sheep that were next door. So he ingrained in me, whatever you do, do not shoot those three black ones. So one day I get home from school and I'm on the tractor and it sounds crazy at 14 driving a tractor. My son's 15 and doesn't want to drive a car. I've been driving since I was 12. I'm on the tractor and I've got a large bell of hay on the tractor and I'm headed across the pasture and I get close to the wood line where I'm going to drop the hay. And I don't know, I'm probably 80, maybe a hundred yards from the fence line. And I see this pack start coming across and I'm counting one, two, three, four. I get to nine, ten, and I'm like, oh, crap, this is the bigger pack. Then all of a sudden, I see the two black ones come through the fence. And I'm like, okay, there's the two black ones. There's the rest of the pack. Where's the alpha? And as I'm scanning, I see her. And, and you got to keep in mind, I'm riding the tractor at this time. They're, they're pretty good ways off. But the other one's colorations, I mean, the land was flat. The other one's colorations were so dark, you knew when they were there. Like, if it's daylight, and there's no cover like you could spot them anywhere they were just they just stood out well the two black ones come through the fence and all of a sudden i see the alpha well when i'm looking at it it, it kind of it, it it floored me because i really don't know really didn't understand what i was seeing it stood up grabbed the top of the fence and the fence was a row of i don't know what it's called it's it's got little you know, four by six inch gaps in a cattle wire with a strand of bob wire on the top. The others would scoot down underneath the fence around the creek bed. Well, this one was near the creek bed, but it grabs the top of the fence and it pulls itself up and over. Stands up on two legs, grabs the fence, pulls itself up and over and hops down on all fours. And I'm thinking, did I just see that? Surely it jumped the fence. It's big enough. I mean, the fence was probably four foot tall. Surely it just jumped the fence. It didn't do that. So I'm trying to rationalize it in my mind and I turn the tractor and I head back to the house. I get to the house and I run inside and, and I said, Pop, Pop, they're back. The big pack is back. And he said, get inside, get inside now. Tell your mother and sister, do not come outside. No matter what, do not come outside. He grabs his rifle, jumps in the truck, drives through the gate and he, he heads back to where I told him where they were. Within about 10 minutes, I hear a gunshot. I'm standing on the back porch. Probably the one time I didn't do what I was told. I was standing outside trying to see, and I hear a gunshot. And within just a few seconds, I hear his truck crank up, and he is just hammering through the pasture. Now, our pasture had a lot of terrace rows in it. If you're not sure what a terrace row is, it's it's where the ground is flat, and there's almost like a speed bump, and it drops down to another level and then another level, and then another level until you get to a bowl. And there were several places like that in our pasture. And the place he had went was back off into one of those bowls. Well, I see him coming, and he's almost jumping these terrace rows. I mean, he is flying up there. Well, he comes up through the pasture, through the gate, and just slides into the yard, and he jumps out. And I'm like, what What happened? What happened? He said, I shot it. I shot one of the black ones. I shot one of the black ones. And I said, you shot one of the black ones. I thought, I thought you said never shoot one of the black ones. And he said, just, just be, be quiet, boy. Be quiet. Let me think. Let me think for a second. And he runs and he gets on the phone and he calls this guy. Uh, he was probably in his twenties, early twenties, mid twenties that always worked with us. He calls him and within about 10 minutes, him and a couple of the other guys that worked with us, they were brothers. They showed up at the house. Well, they take off to the backside of the pasture where he had just came from. And as he gets back there, 
my mom's asking questions. What happened? And I was like, mom, I don't know. It's just the coyotes are back and, and he's panicked. And, and, and she knew about the three black ones. We had talked about it, but obviously as far as I knew, I'm the only one that had ever seen it stand up. So I wasn't about to say, well, you know, the black one stood up and jumped the fence. So I just told her, I said, they came in the past year and I guess, I guess maybe they're attacking a cow or a calf and he's trying to handle it. So uh, a few minutes goes by, he comes back and I go outside and they're all talking and, and I'm like, well, did you find it? You know, did you hang it in the tree? What'd you do with it? And he said, we couldn't find it. And he's like, I know I hit it. I saw it hit the ground. I saw it roll. And I said, I said, you know, you hit it. You know, it, you know, you saw it, you saw it hit the ground. You saw it roll. And I said, but the body, you know, the, the body of it's not there. And he said, no, he said, there's only a spot of blood, maybe the size of a volleyball or a small basketball. And that didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. You know what I mean? I had been hunting a lot and, you know, if you make a good clean shot on something, if it hits the ground, it might get up and run. But if it gets up and run, you're going to find a blood trail. And for there to be a spot of blood the size of a volleyball or a basketball, he had to have had a good shot on it. But he said he could never find the body. So I didn't really know what to think. I didn't really know how to process it. I didn't understand. And, and he wasn't really going into a lot of detail. He was just talking with the guys that worked with us. Now, the guy he called, you got to keep in mind, and this will come into play later, but he was, there's not a lot of, there's Indians in Alabama, but not a lot of like, Native American tribes or tribe land. If you go to South Alabama, there's Wetumpka and places like that. But where we're located, there's not a lot of Native Americans. And this guy, if he wasn't full-blooded Cherokee, he was at least three quarters or maybe half. I'd never met his mom. I met his dad. His dad was for sure full-blooded Cherokee, or at least that's what he told me. And they looked it. I mean, they looked Native American. So he, we'll call him Scott. Scott is uh, telling Pop. I hear them talking and he's like, you know what this is. You, you already know what it is. You've let it go on too long. And I really didn't think a whole lot about it. I asked a few questions and he was like, boy, we'll handle it. It's none of your business. He said, for the next few weeks, I'll handle all your chores, which I was ecstatic about. That meant I could ride my bike. I could go to the neighbor's house. I could sleep late in the mornings. I didn't have to get up, which I had to be on the bus at 645, but. I could sleep till six or six fifteen, not have to be up at five. I mean, it just, it meant a whole new world to me. Little did I know that in that next couple of weeks, I was confined to the house, like could not leave the house. My stepdad pop would take out the trash. He would rake out the scraps. He would crush the feed. He would put out hay. Um, he didn't even go to his job, uh, which his job allowed him to do that. He worked when he wanted to, but he didn't even really go to his job for the next couple of weeks. So, didn't think a whole lot of it other than one night we heard them, the, the pack, in really close to the house. The fence that bordered our yard, was it was a wooden fence, and it was probably five boards high, and it wrapped our entire yard and, and part way down our pasture on each side, and then the rest of it was wire fence. We could hear them outside the fence line in the woods one night, and they're just going nuts. I mean... You can hear them. It's it's like, I don't know if you've ever heard two dogs fighting, but that growling, rawr, rawr, I mean, they're just going crazy. And you hear all of a sudden just this deep, deep, deep growl. I mean, like guttural, like from its insides. And this loud, not really a howl. I don't want to call it a yip because it was, it was kind of deep, but kind of a half howl, I guess. And it went silent. And my stepdad said, get away from the windows. And I was like, why? I want to see him. He was like, get away from the windows. And he said, as a matter of fact, stay away from the windows. Do not go outside at night. Keep the doors locked. Keep the windows locked. Do not raise the windows. Stay inside as much as you can. And I was like, okay, you know, what's going on? And he was like, I'm not real sure. He said, just, just do what I tell you. He said, if I'm not home, if I'm ever not home and it's nighttime, do not ever go outside. He said, I don't care what you hear. You hear a knock at the door. The doorbell rings. You hear something scratching at the window. Do not go outside. He said, you tell me when I get home and I'll handle it. He said, if I'm not home, I will call on my way home. And as soon as I get in the driveway, I will blow my horn three times. Then and only then do you open the door. And when you do so, you use the rifle at the door to, as you open the door and you cover me as I'm coming in the door. And I was like, well, okay, that, that's kind of scary. You know, what do you, what's going on? He said, I'm not real sure, but you just do what I say. So. A few nights later, um, and this rocked on for about, like I say, about two weeks, maybe three, we began to hear things hit the house, like 
rocks being thrown or sticks being thrown. And in the daytime, we would go outside. Sure enough, on the back side of our house, we would see large size, not large branches, but large sticks maybe that had fallen, you know, uh, tennis ball, maybe b- baseball size rocks thrown. You could hear them hit the roof and, and things like that. And it was probably a good 40, 50, 60 yards from our house to the wood line. So something was throwing stuff at the house and, and that got my stepdad panic. And the first night it happened, I asked him what was going on. And he said, she's getting her, she's getting her revenge is how he, he put it. And I was like, who, who is getting their revenge? He said, she is getting her revenge. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, the alpha. And I said, what do you mean she's getting her revenge? He said, I think the one that I shot was her pup. And I said, how do you know? How do you know it's a her? How do you know it's female? He said, because it's not the first time I have seen this thing. He said, I've been dealing this with this for off and on for the last 14 years or so. And, uh, I was like, well, okay. So what does getting her revenge mean? And he said, well, they're throwing stuff at the house. And I'm like, that doesn't even like, that doesn't even compute with me. A coyote is throwing rocks or throwing sticks. Every bit of 40 yards minimum and hitting the house, how are they throwing them? And he was like, you asked too many questions, boy. Just just trust me on this. And I was like, okay, man, whatever. So that calmed down. We stopped hearing him outside the wood line as much. And it got to where he had to go back and do his job. So he tells me, he says, all right, it's time to go back to your normal everyday duties. He said, but here's the deal. He said, from now on, you do not leave before the sun comes up. And he said, when I say the sun's up, the sun's in the sky, not dusk, not dawn, but the sun is up in the sky. And he said, you tell the bus driver to pick you up at the barn. You know, he's here by 645, 650. You tell him that's where you'll be to pull up, blow the horn, and you'll come out and get on bus. And he said, but when you go to the barn, he said, you make sure to carry the shotgun with you. He had a pump shotgun. I don't remember what it was, but uh, I know it was a 12 gauge, but. He said, and this is how I want you to load it. And he said, this is very specific. He said, you load it buckshot, which was 30 yard buck, slug, buckshot, slug, so on and so forth until you are full. And he said, then, and he had this little belt that I guess he used for hunting. I don't know, but it, it would hold probably 20, 30 rounds in it. And he said, I want you to load that gun belt the same way, buckshot, slug, buckshot, slug. He said, that way, when and if you have to reload, you can grab from the front, and you know you got a buckshot, then a slug, a buckshot, a slug. And I said, what does it matter? You know, I mean, if I'm going to shoot one, it's it's going to scare it off. He said, just trust me on this. This is the way I'm telling you to do it. This is what you need to do. So I said, okay, no problem. Me being the good soldier that I am, just listen to what he said. So next morning I get up, I eat breakfast, the sun's up, I grab my gun. It's probably 545, 6 o'clock, springtime. The time had changed. So, yeah, that's that's probably about accurate. Well, it might have been before the time change now that I think about it because yeah, it would have been before the time change if the sun was up that early. So, so I head down to the barn. Either way, you're relevant. I head down to the barn. I know I've got about 45 minutes before the bus gets there and I'm fueling up the tractor because I would have to crank the tractor to start the crusher for the feed. Well, as I'm fueling it up, sure enough, I start hearing the coyote. So I listened to what he told me. I, I got on my bike and, and I headed to the house, which he had told me. He said, if you're ever down there, do not. Shooting is a last resort. Like, do not fire on these things unless they are close proximity. He said, if you can get away, get away. If you can't get away, then hide. And only shoot if they encroach your space. And I was like, well, okay, well, what if there's a bunch of them? He said, well, hide in the hay bales, climb up in the hay loft or climb up on top of the round bells and hide yourself in between them. That way you've got high ground and they can't get close to you, which didn't make sense to me because all of our hay was stacked in the barn. But I was like, okay, man. So as I'm feeling the tractor up, I hear them yipping in the distance. And I, I don't know how close they were. I mean, it was they were a good ways off, but I said, well, I've got enough time to get to the house. So I jump on the bike. Our house was about 200 yards from the barn. I pedal to the barn and I go inside. Well, the next morning I get up, same time, head down, do the same thing. And uh, I'm checking everything. I knew I had already fueled the tractor up. So really all I had to do was get ready, you know, put the feed in the in the crusher and, and crank the tractor and put it in gear and start crushing feed. Well, 
as I was getting ready to crank the tractor, sure enough, I heard them again. And I said, well, they're a good ways off. I really don't want to crush this feed anyway. So I'm just, I'm going to head to the house. I'll do it this afternoon. So I jump on my bike and I head to the house. Well, as I'm pulling in, or say pulling in, as I'm turning in our driveway, I notice one of the black ones. And at the time, I wasn't 100% sure which one. I just knew it was big. It's coming up the side of the barn, which would be facing west. Yeah, northwest comes up the northwest side of the corner of the barn. And it's, there's a fence, like we had our, our pasture sectioned off. That way, if we ever had to round the cows up, we could take them through the big part, back through the smaller part, up through the barn into the lot. Well, it comes up, um, an alleyway, so to speak. There was an alleyway on each side of the barn with fence on one side, barn on the other. And it come up this alleyway and, and, it, and it caught my eye. So I stopped and I watched it. And as I did, like I say, it's a couple hundred yards from the house. So as I did, I just kind of prop up on the house and I'm looking. And it's, it's sniffing the ground, like, like hard at it, like it's tracking something. And this is, this is where I knew what I had seen that day that I was putting hay out was, was accurate. This thing stands up and takes a couple of steps and places its front legs what I will call hands, because you'll understand why in a minute, on top of the gate. Now, the gate to the barn, I'm six foot two, and I've been this tall since I was 13, 14 years old. The top of that gate touched my shoulders, like it was right at my shoulders. So it was a good five feet tall, maybe, give or take. This thing stands up, and its shoulders are at the top of the gate. And it reached up and grabbed the top of the gate like I've done many times and stuck its head over the gate. So it had to be my height, at least, to the top of its head, not including its ears. So all of a sudden, I see it pull itself up. And and I couldn't do this now at, at, at 40 years old, and I couldn't do it at 14. If I was going to climb that gate, I, that's just what I would have done. I would have climbed it. I would have put my hands on the top. Step, 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 throw my leg over, step, step down, or, or hop down on the other side. This thing reaches up, and it grabs the top of that gate, sticks its head in, and all of a sudden just pulls itself up and over that gate and disappears inside the barn. And I'm, I'm, I'm almost sick to my stomach at that point because it's like, did I just, did it just do what I had seen it do, you know, a few weeks earlier? So I stick my arm in the door of the house and like I said there's always a there was always a 30 alt six rifle propped beside the door and it had a scope on it and I I grab the gun and I prop up on the porch and I'm looking down at the barn and and at that time I hadn't zoomed the scope in yet um I'm just I'm looking and I'm watching and then all of a sudden I see this object come over the barn door and then this coyote comes over the barn door with it but when it lands it lands on its back feet and it's standing there and it's holding something and i'm I'm trying to process this keep in mind i'm 14 years old what i'm seeing does not exist what i'm experiencing has is only in movies and i haven't seen very many of those movies at that time still haven't seen a lot of them to this day but it's it's holding something. So I take the scope and I crank it all the way to 10. And when I do it, I can see what it's holding in and it's holding it in its hand. Like, like I would be gripping a drink. It's gripping this thing the same way. And it's, it's got it kind of held up over in front of its head and it's just, it's sniffing it. And I'm looking at it and then it dawns on me. That's my jacket. Like that's, that's my hoodie. What is it? What is it? What's it doing? What? First of all, how is this thing standing up? Second of all, how did it hop the gate? Third of all, how is it holding my jacket and why is it holding my jacket? And at that time, I started beating on the side of the house and I said, pop, pop. He was up. He was eating breakfast and he starts to come running. And as he comes running, I hear the bus in the background, the school bus. 
And, you know, school bus, they have like air brakes. He stopped to pick up the neighbor kid. And when he did, you could hear, you could hear the brakes, the air brakes, you know, make this, this screeching noise. And as it did, it turned and it looked. And as it looked that direction, it looked dead at me, like dead at me. It knew I was watching it. It was fully aware of the school bus in the background. I seen it kind of cock its head, like looking past me and then look back at me. And I don't know if it was showing its teeth, but it looked like it smiled, like it grinned. Like, but when I say grin, not like, hey, you know, hey, Ryan, how to see, hey, good to see you, man. How you doing? Like, hey, Ryan, I see you. I know you. I'm going to get you kind of grin. Like menacing, very, very menacing. So as the bus hits its brakes, it looks, and it's just, it seemed like an eternity. And, and my, my encounters with these things always seem like an eternity, but it's just a few seconds. It drops my jacket, gets on all fours, and goes back the direction it came. In that time frame, my sister's coming outside, and my stepdad's, you know, pop is like, what's going on? What's going on? I'm like, they're at the barn. And he grabs the gun from me. He's like, get on the bus. We'll talk about this later. So I get on the bus, and as he, he would, at the point that he shot the black one, like he would always walk us to the bus. Now, our bus stop from, from our front door to the bus where the bus was on the road was 100, 150, 200 feet. It wasn't far. Like you could walk it in just a few seconds. He would walk us to the bus every day with his rifle every day, every day after he shot that black one. It was routine. He was walking us to the bus. So. Which really doesn't make sense. Like, why would you send me to the barn by myself? <laughs> uh, and, but you're going to walk us to the bus stop every day. And maybe it was for my sister. I don't know. But, uh, I get on the bus and I go to school. Now, where I live, we live in an area where several counties converge in one. And we lived right in the edge of one of these three or four counties. Now, there was a school not more than five minutes from where I lived. But I couldn't go to that school because of the county that I lived in. So the school I went to was probably, if you were driving, it's probably 25, 30 miles from my house. If you were driving, you could drive it in 20, 25 minutes with no traffic, maybe 30 minutes with no traffic. Um, but on the bus, it would take about an hour and 15 minutes. And we, my neighbor was the first kid to get on. We were the second. And then there were some kids down the street that got on and, and then they would come back up the road. So it was an hour and 15 minutes or so to my school from where I live. Well, I get to school that day and I go to my locker. I put my things in my locker. I get my books for first period. I go to homeroom. And as I'm sitting down in homeroom, the intercom comes over. And, and I want to say it was the vice principal. It might have been the principal. I can't remember. But he said, Miss Sides, uh, is Ryan there? And she was like, yes, sir. And he said, tell him to get all of his things and tell him to come to the office. He's checking out. And I'm like, man, I just got to school. You know, why am I, why am I checking out? So I make my way to the office. And, uh, as I get there, as I'm rounding the corner, I see my stepdad and instantly I kind of panic because he, he's checked me out before, like to do work or because my mom sent him because she couldn't come, but we would know when he was coming. Like for us to just be checked out on a spur of the moment or without any kind of notice was not common. Like, uh, and especially not by him. So I kind of panic. I think, you know, is something wrong with mom? Did something happen? I know what I had just seen that morning. Did somebody get hurt? I don't know what's going on. And, uh, I, I go in the office, he signs me out and he's like, come on, boy, we got to go. And I was like, well, what about my sister? What about, what about Shauna? Are you going to get her? And he was like, nope, she's, she's going to stay here. She needs to stay here. You and I got work to do. We got to talk about what happened this morning. So as we're walking out, he's like, tell me exactly word for word what happened. So I tell him the story. I seen it. I was down there about to start crushing. And hey, I hear them yipping. Uh, I jump on my bike. I come to the house. As I'm turning into the yard, I see the, the black, I, I guess, alpha come up the side. I see it go to the barn. I see it stand up, pull itself into the barn. I grab the gun. I look down the scope. It jumps out of the barn. It's holding my jacket. And he said, stop. And I said, okay. 
And he said it was holding your jacket. In. And this is all happening as we're walking to the truck. And I said, yes, sir. It was holding my jacket. And uh, he said, okay, make sense. And I was like, make sense. And as we got to the truck, I smelled the most God awful scent of urine I've ever smelled in my life. And not only urine, but, but almost like death, like maybe it was blood. Um, I know whenever you kill a deer, like you, if, especially if you shoot them in the gut, you can, you can smell just a, a, a putrid death smell. You could smell that and that urine smell. And I was like, what is that? What is pop? What is that smell? And he said, it's your jacket. And this kind of, this kind of puzzled me. I was like my jacket. And he was like, yep, it's in the back of the truck. And as I, I, Got in the truck and sat down as, as he's telling me this. I turn around and sure enough, I see my jacket laying there, but it was, it looked wet. Like it was, it was like a gray jersey type hoodie zip up front. Um, and it was, it was dark, darker gray than normal and almost had a, an orangey yellow tint to it, but it was clearly wet. Like it, I don't know, Vic, if you've ever worn a gray sweatshirt, but if you get something on a light colored gray sweatshirt that's wet, it obviously turns darker. And this is part of it's dry because it's been in the back of the truck and it's road 20, 25 minutes. But for the most part, like it's pretty wet. And, uh, he said, uh, he said, so you can no longer go anywhere by yourself. And I was like, what is that supposed to mean? I can't go anywhere by myself. How am I going to do my job? How am I going to do my chores? And he said, just trust me on this. She's got your scent. And I said, she's got my scent. What is, and you know, and like I said, I'm 14 years old. This is not computing. It's not processing. I'm still having a hard time with what I saw. He's the only person I've told because my friends would think I'm crazy. You know, they would make fun of me. You know, they would, they would ridicule me. You know, oh, whatever. You didn't see that. Oh, you saw a werewolf. You see, see, ha, 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 whatever. So I hadn't told anybody but him. Uh, the whole bus ride to school, like I was silent. I didn't talk to anybody. I didn't speak to anybody. I didn't, and I'm a pretty big cut up. I'm a pretty big jokester. Um, uh, my entire family is, we're very sarcastic. We like to cut up and have a good time. And, and I've been that way my entire life. And I'm sure the people on the bus, like I didn't even speak to my bus driver, like normally because he was the man we bought corn from to crush our feed. So we, not only did I have a relationship as, with him as my bus driver, but he was at my house or he was at our farm a couple of days a week dropping corn off. So I had a really good relationship with him. I mean, like he was one of the family and I didn't even speak to him getting on the bus. So I know he thought it was odd, but, uh, my stepdad said, well, have you talked to anybody about this? And I was like, no, I said, just you. And he said, well, I'm about to tell you something, but you can't tell anybody. And I said, okay. And he said, Ryan, I'm telling you, I mean this. You, you cannot tell, you can't tell your mom. You can't tell anybody. I said, okay, pop, that's fine. I, I, I won't, I won't say anything. He said, I know what this is. And I said, you know what, what is? He said, I know what's going on. I, these are not ordinary coyotes. And I said, okay. He said, uh, about seven years ago, I killed one of these things. Well, he said, well, technically I killed two of them. And I said, okay. He said, but I shot the mother and then I trapped the father and shot the father. And I said, okay. And I said, did they look like the black ones? He said, exactly like the black ones, only bigger. And this was where it gets far fetched. You know, I don't know. I don't know if he was just trying to scare me. Um, I, I've never known this man to lie to me about anything. Even if it was hurtful truth, it was true. You know, like I say, he was a very hard man. <laughs> Most days I didn't, I didn't get called by my name. I got called blankety blank blank you know he was just hard and rough and gruff and he didn't care who you was he was going to tell you the truth and if you didn't like it you'd get over it you know and then if you still had a problem you could fight about it that's just the type of person he was he said that one night he had heard a cow in the back pasture just bellering like crazy and he said he knew that something was attacking it so he said he jumped in the truck grabbed his rifle and he headed to the back 40 for like better words and he said, as his headlights rounded the corner, he said he saw two of the largest things, coyotes, wolves, dogmen, whatever you want to call them, standing on two legs. And then there was a smaller one there with him. He said, now the biggest one was at least seven feet tall. 
He said the smaller of the two was close to six feet tall, at least, was about a foot shorter. And he said it was obvious that they were male and female. He said you could tell, and not to be graphic, but the male had male genitalia. He said, but it looked like a dog. And he said his chest was kind of V-shaped, v V-cut, waist was tiny, um, legs, you know, like a dog, had hands and arms. And the female, he said it, he said the male had, had, he said you could almost see muscle definition in its chest, but they're covered in fur. He said, but the female was shaped more like a female human. Said you could see almost defined breasts. And instead of V tapering, she kind of S shaped like an hourglass. And he said that, um, then there was one that was maybe four feet tall. He would guess, he said it never stood up. It was on, on all fours, but he said by looking at it, it was four feet long or four feet tall for lack of better words. And he said that he immediately drew his rifle and he shot the female was the closest one to him. He immediately drew his rifle, shot the female in the head and she dropped. And he said when he did that the male went absolutely nuts, like just roaring and growling and showing its teeth and then said the little one did the same thing. And said that they dropped to all four or the male dropped to all fours and they turned and they ran. And the whole time they were running, you could just hear this roar. And he said, he said it was almost like they were married, like, like they were in a, they, they had a relationship, I guess. Not like, not like animals have relationships, but almost like humans have relationship. He said you could almost hear sorrow in, in the, the howling and the roaring and he said he said that he immediately went over there and he hooked chains to its feet and he drug it to the barn we had a silo at the barn and the gate had or the door on it had a padlock and it was it was completely empty we stored dry goods dry feed in there he said he took it to the silo shot it two more times once in the heart one more time in the head wasn't breathing he said that he took it and stuck it in the silo and he panicked he said he, he didn't know. He said he said the only thing he could think was werewolf. He said, you know, growing up, he had seen the old werewolf movies and he's thinking, oh, my God, they're real. And I've just killed a human being that's transformed into a werewolf. And I said, well, Pop, what what makes you think that besides movies? And he said. I believe I called his name Scott. Well, I'm trying not to call names. Let's just say Scott, for lack of a better word, had told him that the Native American guy had told him when all of this started 14 years from the day that we're talking about this, the, when he killed the, the big female, that was seven years before, but 14 years before that he had had experiences. He said that Scott had told him, he had told Scott about those experiences. And then Scott had actually witnessed it several years later. He said that he told him that they were skinwalkers. Um, and I've done a little research. It's, they're definitely not skinwalkers, but, that's what Scott said that, that the native people called them, that, that it was Native Americans who took on some ritual and took on the form of a wolf and said they can do it with bears or, or any kind of large animal. And they become this animal. And he said that, that if you ever kill one, you will become what it was. So my pop was panicked. He said that's what he thought had happened, that he had either killed a what Scott was telling him was a skinwalker or a werewolf. And he was panicked that he was going to become what he had killed. So he said immediately the next morning he had gotten up and we would dig pits in the back of the pasture. So like if we ever had dead cattle, we had a, a place in the back that we would dig a pit and we would put them in it and we would just cover them up. Because, I mean, with. 200 head of cattle, it's not common to find a cow dead once a week, something like that. So instead of taking them to the dump or somewhere like that, we just disposed of them on the property. So he said that morning he got up and he had had, he called them bear traps. I don't know if they were bear traps, where he would have gotten those. I don't know, but he said he had them. And he said he had some rebar and some quick creek, concrete. He said, so he went down there and he dug up a pit with the, the back hole on the tractor said he dug it about seven feet deep. He drove the rebar in or dug holes, poured the quick creed in there, drove the rebar in the ground, 
and went back and got the female. And he said, lo and behold, it had not turned. It was still or like a dog or, or, or a wolf or a coyote or whatever with hands. So he said that he got her out, put her in the back of the truck, drove her down and threw her in that pit. And he had taken two of those bear traps and had somehow attached them to the rebar. I don't know if he welded them, what it had to be something sturdy and covered them up and laid her in front of them. And he said, I waited. And he said sometime early in the morning before sunrise, he heard that male just beller, just howl like. And he said it was different than when he had shot the female. He said that it, it was agony, like, like it was in pain, like it was pissed off. He said he just wasn't real sure. So he said he headed down there. And as he got there, he saw the small one up on the bank where he had dug the pit. And he said when he pulled up, it just started immediately growling, showing its teeth. He said it popped up on its hind legs a minute. He said it sat back down, growling, showing its teeth, kind of walking in a circle. And said all of a sudden, the male let out this roar. And he said it sounded different. And when he did, he said the small one took off, like to the wood line. He said it got probably 60 yards from him, turned around, showed its teeth. And headed to the woods. So he uh, said he eased over to the pit. And he's eased over to the pit. He could see the big male was holding the female. But both of its feet were trapped in those bear traps or, or I don't know, coyote traps, whatever they were. And it couldn't go anywhere. And I don't I don't know if it just didn't have the presence of mind or, or maybe maybe they just don't understand that that maybe it could have reached down. I mean, he said the thing was huge. I would think it, the way he described it to me, I would think that it could have reached down and pulled the traps apart and got its feet out. I don't know. But either way, he said it wasn't attempting to escape. It was just holding the female and whimpering. And he said he immediately shot it in the eye and said it let out this just horrible, horrible howl and said he shot it between the eyes and it dropped. He said, but at that point, it wasn't dead. It was still breathing. So he said he stayed there with it till sunrise, still breathing, went back up to the barn and got the tractor and covered it up and left it. So I'm trying to process all of this. I'm trying to compute all of this and none of it is making sense. And I've got a thousand questions. I'm just rattling off, you know, and he's like, look, don't worry about the details. Just trust me when I tell you this. This alpha is out for blood it's out for revenge you cannot go anywhere by yourself it has your scent it it peed on your jacket and by urinating on your jacket that means it knows who you are he said not only that but i went down behind the barn and there was a cow dead and he said and and i saw the cow whenever i got there it was seven eight hundred pound cow full-grown cow and he had kind of cleaned up everything so to speak but the cow was still laying there he said that the eyes were missing the tongue was missing all of its internal organs the liver the heart kidneys all of that like like something had made a perfect incision down its belly along its neck like it like it sliced the bottom of its neck and then sliced its belly open and it sliced it from neck to rear end and then he said and I saw the blood, but he said that the guts were displayed in a perfect circle around the cow. And I could see the blood around it. He had, he had cleaned the, the guts and the stomachs and all that stuff up. And I said, well, why would it do that? And he said, it's letting us know it's intelligent. I said, it's letting you know it's intelligent. He said, yeah. He said, it took what was nutritious that it could get real fast. And then it displayed it's kill to us instead of eating it to show us that it could do more than just kill, that it knew what it was doing by, by removing the important things, the heart, the liver, uh, the kidneys, the eyes, the tongue, by removing those things and then making the circle, it showed us that it was intelligent. So I'm just trying to process it all. Like I don't, I don't know. It doesn't, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me at this point. Like I said, I'm 14 years old and, this sounds like a horror movie to me. Like I am, 
I'm panicked. I'm sweating. Uh, you know, I, I just don't know what to do. And he's like, we'll handle it. He said, I've got Scott involved. Scott knows how to handle these things. We're going to take care of it. And I said, well, okay. He said, just from now on, if I need you, you'll be with me. You'll have a gun. I'll have a gun. If we see those things, we will immediately leave. So that's, that's my story of when I was a kid. That is my only interaction as a child as far as seeing them. Fast forward about three or four years. I was 17. My mom and, and pop, they got divorced. We moved just a few miles down the road, two miles, no more than five miles down the road. And I didn't really think a lot about it then until later in life. But there were certain times at night uh, and we were in an old farmhouse. So, I mean, it creaked and popped and made a lot of noises. But there were nights that I would hear rocks or I would hear sticks hitting the house and I could go outside the next day. And sure enough, where I heard the thud, there would be rocks or there would be sticks on the ground. And there were a couple of nights that I thought what may have been, you know, large rats or because we had mice in that house, I never saw a large rat, so to speak. Uh, but I did see mice. I mean, we would we would trap them from time to time. But I was thinking maybe there were large rats in the attic or um, maybe a coon or a possum or some squirrels had gotten in there and made a nest. But it almost it, it didn't sound like it was in the attic. It sounded like it was on top of the house. But I told myself nothing's on top of the house. That's just something, you know, an animal in the attic and there's nothing to worry about. So I never discussed any of this with my mom. I never told anybody about it. I went back. And I worked with my my stepdad. I worked with Pop for a couple of years after high school. And from time to time, it would get brought up. Hey, have you seen those things anymore? Have you had any more interaction with them? And he was just always real short to the point. Nope, boy, we got work to do. We don't need to talk about that. So, you know, I don't know if he ever saw them again. He has since passed away. And I lost touch with him in my early 20s. Like I say, we didn't have a real good relationship as far as like communication father and son relationship it was more business like he was the boss i was his employee type thing so when i stopped working for him i I just kind of lost all communication with him and and stopped going around so i don't know if he had any other interaction uh later on in life i do know that he gave the farm to his eldest son whom i didn't have a relationship with like i said he was 20 years older than my mom he had three children. Those children were older than me um, by several years, and I never really had a relationship with them. I never really talked to them much. If they could ever, if they did come around, it was, hey, how you doing? That was about it. So I don't know, and he still lives on that property. I don't know if he has seen anything or had any problems uh, as far as that goes on that part of the property. Now, fast forward to 2009, 2010. At that point, I'm probably 30, I guess. At that point, I had started going to church. My mom had always brought us up in church, and I would go to church on Sundays and Wednesdays just so I didn't have to work. <laughs> uh, that was a horrible excuse. But I, I learned a lot, and, and I, I gave my life to Jesus Christ, and I've been following him ever since. And like I said, I've been doing ministry, and I got to know this guy that went to our church. And lo and behold, he lived on the neighboring farm like it was his family's farm. He still lives there. Well, we'll get to that in a minute, but he still lives there currently. His dad had given him his house when he got married and we didn't know each other growing up, but we got to know each other because we were going to church together. And our farm headed out to the end of the property and then there was some woods and then the main road come through there. And then when you cross that road, my buddy's property, he has about 200 acres that's that's up next to that property. We'll call him Mike. Uh, Mike has a property, and uh, that's where he grew up. And by me going to church with him, got to talking to him, we were talking about hunting. And I used to take students hunting a lot. And by this time, I had really put everything that happened as I was a child in the back of my mind. Like, I, I really, I was, I was kind of leery about going out in the woods, but. I knew that we had kind of dealt with these things and that they were possibly by this time, surely they should be dead because dogs don't live that long, you know, and it's been a good, you know, 15 years or so since I had seen one. 
uh, at least 10 years, you know, 12 years since I had, maybe even 15 years since I had even heard anything remotely close to uh, what I thought might have been something similar. So we, we get to become really, really close friends in a short amount of time. And he was like, hey, man, I've always had a couple of guys that hunted my property and helped me maintain and manage it. He said, they both backed out. He said, would you be interested? And I was like, heck yeah, man. I said, you know, so we're going to make a hunting club. You know what? And he said, well, not really a club. He said, right now, it'll be just you and I, our wives and our children. Uh, and then we may add a third guy if I think the deer population needs to be thinned out after this year. So I was like, okay, man, yeah, we'll do it. What, you know, what I need to pay. And he was like, the only thing I ask is that you help me plant the green fields, help me hang stands, clear roads, clear, you know, shooting lanes, things like that. And he said, other than that, you got free reign. You don't have to call me. He said, my only main request is if you do come to the property, let me at least write a note. Let me know what stand you're in. Let me know if you plan to move stands, whatever. He said, that way I know where you're at and then I won't come in on top of you. But if something wants to happen, I know where you're at at all times and I can come get you. He said, I, I do want you to check in by noon. If you hunt the morning, I want you to check in by noon. And by that time we had cell phones, so we could call. Texting wasn't really big, but, but I mean, you had to pay to text, but we could call. He said, so you can call me or you can come out if you hunt the morning. And he said, if you hunt the night, the only thing I ask is that you be out of the woods 30 minutes after dark. If you kill something, then call me and I'll come help you. He said, but most days you're hunting, I will be hunting too. So that that would have been 2009. That year of 2009, I hunted every day. My job allowed me to do so. I'm not going to say what I did because it may put two and two together for people, but I had freedom in my job. I could get up, I could hunt in the morning, I could go into the office, I could be gone by 2 o'clock, in the stand by 2.20, and hunt till dark. And killed a lot of deer that year, man. No real rack bucks, but we found out a lot of does, which we needed to do. Um, we weren't seeing, we were seeing big bucks on camera at night, but nothing in the daytime. So we got a game plan together. We were going to plant corn and we were going to plant some peas and things like that on one green field and then three or four other little green fields and make some good shooting lanes on the hardwood. So we worked really hard that summer. I hunted, like I said, every day of season that year from opening bow season in October to the last day of gun season, January 31st, I hunted every day, if not morning and night, at least one or the other. Didn't see anything out of the ordinary. Didn't see a coyote. Didn't see a bobcat. Saw a couple of yard dogs from people that lives in the vicinity, uh, but nothing that spooked me in any kind of way. So the next spring, we are down in the river bottom, which coincidentally scott the guy who helped us there's a pasture in the river bottom he rented that pasture or, or owned it i can't remember uh, i think he rented it and he had cattle in there and you would go down this long rocky road and it wasn't it was a hill going down but mike's wife we'll call her stephanie stephanie ran that road a lot they were really into fitness and and staying in shape and i'm i'm not that way if you see me running uh you better start running too um, because something's chasing me. <laughs> That's just the way I am. I don't run, but I could easily walk that hill and, you know, might get a little winded, but nothing bad, but it was about a mile long. So we drove down there, went through the pasture and went to the river bottoms and we were going to, there was a pine thicket and there was a spot to plant a green field, probably 60 or 80 yards wide. And then you hit a, or, or circle. That's, it wasn't really a circle. It's kind of an oval, but then you hit a pine thicket for, a hundred yards and then you were at the river bottom. Well, we were down there one day looking at the river and we were talking about bow fishing that summer um, because the river will get low and it will create natural sand banks in the middle and like you will have a 15 or 20 yard maybe 30, 40 yard pool of water that's knee deep and then a, a big sandbar in the middle and then another one on down when the sandbar ends and what happens is when the river gets low in the summertime, those fish get stuck in there and we would bow fish. So it was just, it was easy pickings and it, and it helped us sharpen our bow skills for bow season. So we're down there one day and, uh, I see this paw print and it's just one. It's on a sandbar or sandbank right in the middle of the river. And 
I'm going to be conservative and say it was about the size of a softball. It was really probably 10 inches in a circle you know, from one side to the next. Um, it was big. And I understand that when you step in sand, you leave an impression in the sand and it could have, have spaced out. There was an evidence of a, a, a paw print. You could see it, and then you could see, like, little claw marks, but that was it. And uh, there's a legend where we're at, and I'm not going to call the name of the creature, but it's a, a Bigfoot-type body with a cat-like head. And if anybody's from this area, they'll know exactly what I'm talking about. And this legend has floated around for years. Like, my son has heard it, and not for me. Um, some of his friends have heard it, and, and I've never talked about it, but it's just a pretty common folklore around here. I, I guess it's folklore. I don't know. And Mike says, oh, it's probably just the so-and-so creature. And I was like, buddy, if you knew what I knew growing up, you wouldn't joke about things like that. And I didn't say it, but that's what I'm thinking in my mind. And they kind of laugh, and he said, oh, it's probably just some sort of cat, some sort of big cat. And I'm like, Sean, we don't have big cats in Alabama. We have bob cats. But that's, you know, that would be a big bobcat. And he was like, well, I've heard tales of there being a mountain lion and a panther. And, you know, I don't even know if panthers really exist. But it, there's there's tales of, of, of some sort of big cat around there that people have quote unquote seen. I don't know. I've never seen it. And I said, well, either way, man, we need to keep an eye out for it. And he's like, you're right. So we decide where we're going to set the blind up that summer. And, and we plant the field. And when fall comes around. We hunted hard, I mean really hard in 2010, and none of us had been down to that bottom yet, and we had pictures on a trail cam. Um, we had a fancy cam that would send pictures to our phone, uh, so when it snapped a picture, we got an email, and um, we got pictures of big bucks, I mean big rack bucks, 12 points, down there on this field in broad daylight, I mean like 10 o'clock. 9 o'clock in the morning, 1 o'clock in the afternoon, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, but never any pictures of them at night. So I said, well, you know what I'm going to do? Since it's been untouched since we set the blind in the greenfield up, I'm going to go down and I'm going to hunt this stand. So I go down there, and it's probably 4 o'clock, maybe 4 o'clock. It's about an hour before dark, and um, it's cold. I'm sitting in a, in a blind, like a ground blind. I've got a chair, I've got a heater, I've got my pack with my snacks and my TP just in case Mother Nature hits, and uh, my rifle. And I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden, I hear just the most god-awful scream. Like, it was close, Vic. I mean, like, it was closer than 100 yards, probably. It was close. And it just, it sounded like a woman being murdered. Like, it was crazy i mean it it made the hair on my neck stand up like it was crazy and then all of a sudden i hear a roar right behind it and i instantly got sick to my stomach like like the feeling i don't know if you ever been pulled over by a cop and and you know you were speeding he's got you dead to rights and 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 you're just instantly sick to your stomach like you don't know if you're gonna puke or you don't know if you're gonna poop it's peak or poop time. It's one of the two. That's the way I felt. And then it hit me. I said, I know that noise. I know that noise. I said, there's, there's, there's no way. There's no way that can be the noise that, that I heard when I was a kid. But it sound, it sounded just like it only a little more mature, a little raspier, but it was close. I mean, close. And I immediately got up. I got my rifle. I left my heater, I left my chair, I left my pack, I left everything, and I headed out the back side of the blind, which was facing, uh, would have been facing north, out into the pasture. And as I'm going through the pasture, I'm getting my phone out, and I'm trying to call Mike, and I'm, I get him on the phone, I'm like, man, did you hear that? And he's like, hear what? And he was probably a good three or 400 yards from where I was hunting, maybe five. He's back up the hill on top of the mountain. And I said, uh, did you hear that? And he was like, what? And I said, did you hear that, that howl, that, that, that roar? And he was like, I heard what sounded like a coyote, but it sounded like it was far off. And I said, well, it wasn't far off. It was where I'm at. And it wasn't no freaking coyote. I said, did you hear both of them? He said, I didn't hear both of them. I just heard the one. He said, it sounded really long, but, 
but I didn't think much of it. You know, I hear coyotes all the time. I said, well, I'm out. I'm on my way out. And he, you know, and he, he made fun of me. He called me a sissy and he said, oh, you're just scared. You're scared of the dark. You're in the river bottom. The so-and-so creature, that's what it was. And once again, in my mind, I'm like, dude, if you knew what I knew, you would not be joking and you would get down out of that tree too. So I made it to my truck. I told him, I said, I'm, I'm at the truck. I'm just, I'm going to the house. So I went to the house and I didn't hunt the rest of that season. He would call, he would text, Hey man, are you, are you coming? Are you going to hunt today? No, I'm I'm not going to hunt. I mean, just leave me voicemails. Hey man, I'm hunting. Are you coming? I avoided him really. I'd seen at church, we'd talk and I'd just tell him, man, I'm busy. I just, I don't have time. I made up all kinds of excuses. Well, fast forward to the spring of that year in 2011, we got hit by some hellacious tornadoes. We got hit back to back during the night and early in the morning. And it just so happened that that tornado, I believe, was an F5. Don't quote me on that. It might have been an F4. Came through our area, and it wiped out part of our hunting property. It cleared a path probably 400 yards wide and every bit of a mile. And, and you got to understand, like, the top of the property was was up on a mountain, and it kind of gradually made its way down. And there were some places that were real steep drop-offs. Um, there were places that had some caves in it that I I for sure wouldn't go. Uh, we had a, a running joke that if we ever wanted to hide a body that let one of us know, we would hide it in this cave, drop it in this hole. <laughs> but uh, it devastated the property, man. I mean, we had a lot of work to do. And he called me the, that afternoon, and he said, man, he said, did y'all get any damage? And I was like, no, we didn't. You know, we watched it. We saw it come across, but that was it. And uh, he said, well, we got damage at the property, and I need your help. Can you come help me? And I was like, yeah, man, I'll – reluctantly, but I was like, yeah, man, I'll, I'll – I mean, this dude's my best friend. I'm like, yeah, man, I'll, I'll come help you. Uh, just let me know what day. So we set up a time and, and a day to get started. So we went through clearing the roads, and there were some, some areas where trees had kind of fallen, and they fell really – close to the ground that almost made like natural lines we were able to take some brush and build up around them and and what we thought at the time was devastating actually turned out to be pretty good because you could see a good long distance and you could see the deer coming through um we saw them when we were out there cleaning up just moseying through like you could see them hundreds of yards away and with all the dead limbs and stuff we're thinking but we'll for sure hear them if we don't see them first so we made several areas with little natural ground blinds and little small green fields that were probably 30, 40 yards in circumference. Some of them were, were maybe 80 yards. You know, we had three or four of them. So fast forward to that following hunting season, and I had built my nerve up. I'm going to go hunting. I'm going to spend some time with Mike. Uh, I'm going to get my kids out. My son loved to hunt. He was about five or six at the time. And I got my nerve up, but not that much. There was a big green field right behind his house. It was far enough away that it didn't spook the deer, but close enough that if I was in the stand, we had a, a tree stand, a solo stand, and we also had a ground blind set up. I was close enough that if I, if it was getting dark and they flipped the light on, I could see the light come on and I could see them walk in the house. Or if they were on the back porch, I could hear them talking, but I couldn't necessarily make out their conversation. I just knew. I knew their voices, and if they were outside, I knew who was outside. If they were on the phone or if they were outside grilling or talking to one another or whatever, I, I would know they were out there. So I would never venture far, far from the house. So it got to be, it would have had to have been mid-December, close to Christmas, maybe the week of Christmas, now that I think hard about it after our conversation the other day, Vic. It would have had to have been the week of Christmas because that's usually when rut started, around the 15th or the 20th of December. That morning, Mike and I were going to go hunting. And uh, he had sent me a text. And like I said, we didn't do that a whole lot because it cost money. But he sent me a picture about 3 o'clock in the morning and it woke me up. And it was of this thing called the rake. And if you Google search it, you can look up the Rake Deer Trail Cam. And most people that are listening to this probably know the exact picture I'm talking about. But he sends me that picture, and he's like, hey, got this on the trail cam this morning. And I look at it, and I'm like, I'm out. I'm not hunting. And he texts me back, and he was like, ha, 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 just kidding. 
just wanted to let you know I can't hunt this morning. And he said, uh, Stephanie's been sick through the night and I can't go. And then we've got some errands to run. He said, so you're on your own. Just shoot me a text or call me whenever you get, whenever you get here and let me know what stand you're going to. And I immediately responded back. I was like, I'm not going. And he was like, you're not going. I said, nope, I'm not going to go. And he was like, oh, don't let that picture scare you, blah, blah, blah. So I skipped the hunt. Now, let me back up just a moment. When we were cleaning that property, Mike's wife uh, liked to run a lot. So that particular Saturday we were working, she was running the road. And she would do this quite often, three or four times a week, probably, she would run this road. And it was about a mile, mile down and a mile back to the river bottom. And she shoots, typically carries a gun. I can't remember if she had a gun or not. She had this holster that would strap to her leg. I remember, I mean, sitting here thinking about it, it's like, why would she be running with a gun? That would be hard to do. But knowing her, she probably was. Mike always carries. I always carry. And Stephanie comes running up to where we're at. And she said, uh, the strangest thing just happened to me. And we're like, what's going on? And she said, I was just chased by coyotes. And our ears kind of perk up and we're like, okay, what were they doing? And she said, well, I would run. And she said, I could hear them kind of yipping and, and carrying on in the background. And she said, it got my attention and I stopped and then it stopped. And then she said, one darted across in front of me and then another one darted across in front of me. They're probably 40, 50 yards up. And I started running again and they started running. Now, if you know anything about predators, predators chase their prey if something runs it is it's the dinner bell basically it's it's time to eat so in my mind i'm like why were you running you shouldn't have been running if you saw them you should have just stopped calmly walked and, and made your way back up here and uh she said yeah they would i would stop they would stop i would start they would start i would stop they would kind of dart in front of me and across and mike was like they're flanking you and i'm thinking the same thing and she said what do you mean flanking me and he said they were stalking you they were hunting you you were running. They saw you as prey. They're trying to distract you. And and the ones behind were the ones that would attack. And she was like, surely not. And he's like, I'm telling you, that's what they were doing. And she said, well, one of them, she said, it was really, really pretty. She said, I saw a black one. And at that moment, like, it, it made me sick to my stomach. Like, I, I, I'm having flashbacks to, to when I was a kid. You know, black coyotes are just not common. I mean, I'm not saying that it doesn't happen, but it's not common. And I'm thinking back to that noise from the fall or the wintertime before, you know, the, the hunting season before. And Mike is like, yeah, I've, I've seen it a couple times, too. And he said, I never thought much about it. He said, at first, I thought it was a German shepherd. And then I saw it with several other just normal looking coyotes. And he said, I just thought it was a black coyote. And like, I'm I'm freaking out at this moment, you know. And she said, well, the really weird thing was, was one time when I stopped, it was almost like they were laughing. She said, it sounded like, like hyenas, like you would hear a hyena laughing. And I'm like, okay, that, that doesn't make sense to me, but maybe they just yip. I don't know. Maybe when they're yipping it and all of them at once, it sounds like they're laughing. But I looked at her, I said, Stephanie, I'm going to tell you this. Never, ever run that road again. And she said, well, I run that road all the time. And Mike was like, I run it too. And I said, y'all, you, you do not need to do it. At least don't do it alone and don't do it without a weapon. And, uh, they could tell like my body language. I'm starting to sweat. I, I'm panicked. They can tell I'm panicked and they're like, what's wrong? And I'm like, nothing. I'm just telling you right now, if they were flanking you, just like Mike said, if they were flanking you, they were hunting you. And I said, I said, was the black one bigger than the rest of them? She said, oh yeah, it was, it was a lot bigger. And I said, okay, I'm telling you. And I knew, Vic, at that moment, I knew. I don't, I don't know how or why I knew, but I knew. So we finished cleaning up. That was summertime. Now back to the wintertime when Mike sends me that picture. Um, if you look it up, like I said, uh, if you Google search rake deer trail cam, and I, I sent you a picture of it the other night, he sends me that picture and he texts and he's like, got this on the camera this morning. And I'm freaking out a little bit, but it's like, oh, that's fake. And, uh, he's like, no, seriously. He said, I can't go. Stephanie's been up sick all night and we've got some errands to run this morning. He said, we may take her to the doctor. I don't know yet. Um, uh, but I can't hunt the morning hunt. Are you still coming? 
And I'm sitting there looking at that picture, and and in my mind, I'm like, and I'm thinking about the summer. I'm thinking about the winter before. I'm starting to think about when I was a kid. I'm like, no, I'm I'm not I'm not gonna go. Um, and like I said, I had built my courage up to hunt, but it was always close to the house. It wasn't far, you know. Um, uh, but I was I was dead set on I wasn't gonna go that morning. So I get up, and I mill around the house, and I'm sitting there thinking about it. And I'm like, man, you're being a wimp. There's nothing out there. It's just coincidence. That picture and the picture didn't really spook me. Like I can, I'm pretty sure that picture was fake or at that time, I'm pretty sure it was fake, but I just kept dwelling on her running. She said they sounded like they were laughing and them trying to flank her. And that was just really playing on my mind. And, and I just sat there and I said, you know what? I'm not going to let this rob me of something I enjoy doing. I said, so man up. Suck it up, buttercup. Get your stuff and go to the woods. So I get to Mike's house and I call him. And I'm like, and they're not back yet. And I'm like, hey, man, I'm going to hunt this afternoon. And he's like, all right, I'll be home in a couple of hours. He said, I might try to go if there's enough daylight left. And it's about 2 o'clock. I always try to be in the woods by 2, 2.30 if I'm hunting the afternoon. And he said, uh, I should be home. But if I'm not, then just holler at me before you leave and uh, be out by dark. And he said, definitely, if you kill something, let me know. Let it lay. We'll get the four-wheelers. We'll go get it. And I was like, okay, man. So I get there, and, and it's still playing on my mind. I'm still thinking. And I was like, you know what? I'm tired of this ruling my life. I'm tired of, of being scared. There's no way this thing is still alive some 15-plus years later. I'm going somewhere different. I'm not hunting close to the house. So I walk past the first green field. And I come up on some of those natural areas that, that the trees from the tornado had made. And I said, I'm going to hunt here. I said, it's, it's far out. It's, it's several hundred yards away from the house, but it's still close enough to the house that if something happened, I could scream or I could yell and they or call and they could be here within just a moment or two, you know, within five minutes, they could be where I'm at. So I'm sitting there and it's a pretty good afternoon. Um, I hadn't really seen any deer at that point, but it was kind of warm. You know, it was probably a 50 degree day there. And like I said, it was, it was rut and we had been seeing bucks on camera. And, and I said, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to hunt. I'm going to do this. So I'm sitting there and about four o'clock, the deer around there, you could set your watch to them around the house. Like by 4 p.m., if not a few minutes before at 4 p.m., the deer are creeping up on the fields. I mean, they're there. If you want to, if you wanted to kill it, like I could take you every day of the year because Mike has even told me that right there, even in the summertime, he sees deer right there on the greenfield behind the house. We could set our watch blind four o'clock every day. There's deer on the field. So sure enough, four o'clock, I know it's getting that time. I look up and there's four does on the field and we we each tried to kill five a year. I had already killed about seven. Uh, my son had killed a couple. We had a lot of meat in the freezer. Um, so I was dead set on not shooting a doe. But at the same time, I did want to shoot a deer. But it's like, no, I'm not going to shoot a doe. I'm going to wait. We, we've had some buck activity in the area. It's rut. I'll see a buck, I'm sure. If not on the green field, I'll see him out in the opening where the, the trees have fallen. So. I'm sitting there and I'm looking at these deer through my scope and about 80 yards away. And this, this part of it gets tough to me. About 80 yards away, I see this movement. And it's, it's, it's a shimmer, almost like it, like, like light reflecting off of something. But it, it catches my eye, like my naked eye. I had pulled back from the scope and it catches my naked eye. And I was like, well, what was, was that a, was that a flash of a tail? You know, was, 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 did I get busted? You know, are they, is a, is a flag flying on a deer? So I began to scan the area. And, uh, and that's, that's when I see it, Dick. I don't know what it was. I know. I would rather see a thousand dog men than this. I'm looking at the picture that Sean had sent me that night before 
only uh, only its its eyes were different. Its nose and mouth were its mouth was probably six or eight inches wide, but real thin lip. Two little best I could tell, and I mean I zoomed in on it. Two little nostrils, but its eyes were massive. And uh its its skin was its skin was white and it was clear, like you could you could see through it almost like I would from from what I remember of it and from what I saw, I would think if you were up close to it, you could probably see the bones in its skin, maybe at least its veins, if it has veins, or possibly its organs. I mean, it just looked really like transparent, translucent. And and at first I thought, this is a ghost. Am I seeing a ghost? Are my eyes playing tricks on me? Is that a stomp? And then it blinks. And the whole time it's looking at the deer, like it hasn't seen me. It, it's looking at the deer, but it blinked. And, and when it blinked, it was like, you know how crocodiles or alligators, when they blink, they have this, this skin that comes down over their eyes. Or, or when a shark goes to bite, it has this, this skin that comes down over its, it's an eyelid. But I know in, in, in reptiles, they, they have this, this sheath, so to speak, that they can see underwater and, and it cleans their eyes. And, and it was almost, I, I don't know if it was cleaning its eyes, if it was adjusting its eyes. Ugh. It, uh, it was the nastiest, disgusting, most menacing looking thing I had ever seen in my life. Real thin. Its arms and legs. It looked, it looked almost like a, like a bug or, or like a praying mantis, but man sized. It, it had four limbs. I don't know if they were arms and legs, but it was standing on all four and it's bent like like it's on its hands or it's on its feet and it's got these knobby like knobby elbows joints and they're they're the way it's shaped like it's it's elbows or it's joints or it's knees whatever it was are kind of high up in the air and its body is kind of arched below its legs or arms and its head's kind of sticking up in the air and and I'm just uh, like, I can't figure it out. It's like, am, am I tripping? Am I imagining this? I look away. I look back. By this time, it had moved just a little bit and I caught movement and it, it, its legs moved like, like a bug. Um, like it, it almost kind of like, like swung its leg when it walked, if that makes sense. Like it's hard to, if I was there with you, I could show you the movement, almost like like a swimmer when they're swimming on top of the water and they're they're coming over the top of their their body or over you know from their body across their head and grabbing the water. That's almost how it it stepped forward and then it stopped. The deer lifted their head, it stops, it it it's still focused on them, it's still licking its eyes, cleaning its eyes, whatever you want to call it. And then I hear this noise that's about 20 yards to my left. And I'm thinking, this thing has got a partner. There's two of them. It's got me. It's, it's distracted me and it's got me. It's, it's, it's coming up on me. And as I look to my left, there she is. It's the alpha. I know it's her. Beyond a shadow of a doubt, I know it's her. Same, same build, um, same, her, her fur was a little grayer, her hair, whatever you want to call it, was a little grayer than it was when I was a kid. But the, the only thing that didn't look familiar, familiar to me was her face. Her face, I don't know if you've ever seen, um, the thriller video by Michael Jackson when he turns into the werewolf in that video. But its face looked like that. She didn't have a long snout. It was kind of pushed, kind of, kind of pushed back a little bit, kind of, kind of a stubby snout. These just teeth that you could see her, I guess her canine teeth, the bottom ones like protruding up the top of her lip. And then the top ones 
protruding down, almost like kind of like a hog, like we discussed earlier. When the hog opens and closes its mouth, its teeth kind of go in between one another. And I've been told that's for sharpening. I don't know. But that's kind of how its mouth looked. But real, real short muzzle, standing about six feet tall. She's got an hourglass shape, like my stepdad had described. And what I would call breasts, not a, not a pectoral muscle and not, you know, anything just a great C cup or anything like that, but just kind of small, almost like, like maybe she has nursed in her life, but breasts. And then standing beside her is uh, another one and it's jet black. And to me, it looked younger. It wasn't, it was taller, like, to the top of its head not including its ears but to the top of its head it was we went back and 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 we'll get to this in a minute but mike and i went back and there's a a branch that its head was touching and it was about seven feet tall to that branch and it's got a v-shaped torso you can see pectoral muscles but it looked it looked it was big. I mean, big, but it looked gangly. Like it looked young, almost like a teenager kind of. Um, and she looked older. The male, and it was a male. I couldn't see his feet. I could see from about his knees up and they were, they were shaped like a dog. I don't know if that's backwards or what I've heard people describe it as backward bent legs. I don't know that they're backwards. I think that, I think that they're facing the right way. They're just the way the knee or, or whatever is structured. It doesn't, it doesn't bend like ours does. But anyway, I could see from about the knee up, its waist was considerably skinnier. They both had tails. His tail was longer than hers. And they both had hands. And I don't mean, I mean, hands like, oh, you ever seen a raccoon's hands? Uh, it's not like a raccoon's hands, but, but how they, their thumb, a raccoon's thumb is long. They, it almost looked like they had five fingers. It was not a thumb. It was that, that fifth digit where a human's thumb would be was just as long as the other four fingers. And I mean, this thing's 20 yards from me. I mean, like it's staring dead at me. And I, I mean, I can see her. I can see her feet. I can see her legs. She's pretty muscular, but not like, not like ripped up bodybuilder muscular, but you can tell they're in shape. And, and the male. The male is, is intent on, on, it's looking past the deer. And, and at this point in time, I'm seeing white flags from the deer. Their tails is what we call it. We call it a flag. They're blowing. They're jumping. They're hopping. They're gone. And I lock eyes with female and I lock eyes with the male and her eyes were, were almost cat like. Both of their eyes were like, if you took, if you, they were, they were yellow, amber colored. Like if you took and held a beer up to the sun and, and got the sunlight through a beer in a glass bottle, that's what, that's what color their eyes are. I'm, I've still got my gun on, on whatever this white thing is. And I look down my scope. And as I look down my scope, I'm, I'm looking through one eye at them trying to see what's going on. She turns away from me and looks back at the white thing. I look at it and it cocks its head like it sees me and, and it's gut check moment for me. It's like, do I shoot it or do I shoot them? I've got five rounds. I can maybe in a bolt action 270, maybe shoot one and it scare both of them off, turn and shoot the white thing as I reload or shoot, reload, shoot, reload and shoot the white thing. Or maybe just shoot one of them, scare all of them off. I don't know. This is going through my head. So I immediately turn my gun to the alpha and I know it's her Vic and she knows it's me and she's looking at me so like she's got almost a puzzled look like like you see somebody you knew as a child and then you see them when you get older and it's like hey don't I know you but she also looks extremely ticked off and as I point my gun to her she raises her right hand and she folds four of the fingers, leaving one finger like she's going to point up. And she points at me and she she nods her head no. 
like like she knew what a gun was. I mean, I I don't know. I don't know how intel. I mean, I know what my stepdad tells me. I know what I witnessed with my jacket, but I don't know how intelligent these things are. She shakes her head no, and as she does, she scans her finger across the field and points at the white thing. And when she does, it lets out this just, this noise. And I instantly knew the noise. It was the same noise I heard in the river bottom, the woman screaming. She, she just, it, it just lets out this, just, oh, just, I mean, blood curdling, like, I've got chills thinking about it right now. And as she does, the male, or I'm sorry, as the white thing screams, the male howls. And instantly, the female howls as well. And I recognize it. And those, the combination is exactly what I heard in the river bottoms that day. And I instantly get sick, but not like, like I did before. My head started hurting. I got nauseated, like the noise. And I don't know if, if the noises they were making affects, affects humans. I, I don't know. I've never felt like this before, but I got dizzy and, and I guess I passed out. Um, I came to and it was dark. Now it was, it might have been 415 by that time that, that all of that had happened and transpired. It might not have been that late, but I know it was dark outside. So it was a good 45 minutes or an hour that I was passed out, that I was, I was out. I was asleep. And my phone rings and I, I never had my ringer on. But I wear overalls or, or bibs whenever I go to the woods and I put my phone in my front pocket so I can feel it vibrate and it's vibrating and it wakes me up and I grab my phone and, and, and I, at this point, I don't realize it's dark yet. I'm thinking, God, what an awful dream. I answer my phone and Mike is like, Hey man, you okay? And I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. What's up? And he said, brother, it's dark. And it's past dark, like 45 minutes past dark. Are you sure you're okay? I was like, yeah, man, I'm fine. And he said, well, I was, I was getting worried. He said, I was about to jump on the four wheeler and head that way. And he said, I, I thought I would call first thinking maybe you shot something. I didn't hear a gunshot, but we hadn't been home, but maybe an hour and a half, two hours. And, and it was too late for me to go out. And, and I just, I thought maybe you had killed something and, or possibly had moved stands or whatever. And, he said, I just, I just wanted to check on you. Where are you at? And I said, well, I'm, I'm back here behind the house. I'm in the natural blinds. And I said, I'm on my way. And he said, well, you need me to come get you. And I was like, no, man, I just, I fell asleep. I fell asleep. I'm good. And I hang up the phone real quick. So I get up and I grab my pack and, and, and I grab my gun and I, I feel something wet and my, my pants are soaked, like soaking wet. And, and I drink a lot of water when I'm in the woods. Um, I drink a lot of water anyway, but I, I urinated on myself. I don't, I don't know why. I don't know. At this point, I'm so dis, just disoriented and confused, Vic. I don't, I don't, I'm not a hundred percent sure if I was dreaming or what had happened. So I start out and as I start out, I see flashlights and, and Mike and Stephanie are on their way and I'm headed out and man, I, I, I'm, I don't know. I'm several hundred yards from the house. And I'm booking it. I'm trying not to run. I'm trying not to be spooked. I'm trying to tell myself you were dreaming. You were dreaming. I definitely didn't want to see them to see that my pants were wet. And I just, I walked past them. And as I walked past them, I was like, man, are you all right? And I was like, I'm good. I'm good. I'm going to the house. And they were like, you sure? I was like, I'm good, man. I'll, I'll talk to you later. So I jump in the truck and I go to the house. Now I always change outside, like in my garage whenever I get home. I'm real big on not taking my hunting clothes in the house um just different i mean and i mean i guess it could get smells on it from the garage too but i'm, I'm real funny about that i've got bags i put them in and uh, i wear scent lock stuff and so i strip down but the unusual thing is is normally i have a base layer or some sort of under armor or something like that on when it's cool and it wasn't really cold that day but i figured it would get cold when it dipped down so i was wearing my under armor and i just stripped completely naked now, I've got a six-year-old son at this time. I've got a three-year-old baby girl. And I walk in the house. 
and I just left my clothes laying in the garage. I walk in the house, butt naked, and my wife's like, what are you doing? And I was like, what do you mean, what am I doing? She said, what are you doing? I was like, I'm going to take a shower. And she was like, why are you, why are you naked? And I said, well, I just, it was, it was a hard day. Uh, I, I sweated a whole lot. I, I tracked some deer and I just, I was just real sweaty. I didn't want to bring that in the house. And it, I just, I just stripped down out there. I'm going to take a shower. So I went to the shower and I immediately went to sleep. Well, it turns out Mike had called me several times throughout the night. I didn't answer it. I heard it a couple times, but I didn't roll over. And I was, as I was asleep that night, I had this dream. And in my dream, I am in the same spot I was in hunting, the same blind, the same scenario, four deer on the field. It's four o'clock. I see this white thing. The, the two dog men, for lack of better words, Alpha, and I don't know if it's her pup or her mate or what, they show up. I turn my gun, she raises her finger, shakes her head, and points. And as she does, she says, and, and, and she, she doesn't move her mouth. It's almost like, I don't know if she's communicating te- telepathically with me in my dream. I mean, it's a dream. You know what I'm saying? I don't know what it means. Um, if anybody does, I'll, I'll take some clarification. Um, she says, we are not your enemy. That thing is. She said, that is what killed your cattle so many years ago. That is what has killed the deer and the cattle on this property for years. And she said, we hunt those. She said, I have tracked you your entire life. If I had wanted to kill you, I could have. And she said, there's been times that I have wanted to because you are the man's pup. I don't know what that means, but she said, you were the man's pup and he killed my pup as well as my mother and my father is the way she said it. And she said, I wanted my revenge, but I knew it wouldn't be good to be like the man. And I woke up. And when I woke up, it was daylight. I look at my phone. I've got several missed calls and several messages from Mike. I call him back whenever I got up about 7.38, and he says, man, why why are you not answering your phone? I was like, man, I got home. I was so tired. I said, I fell asleep in the woods, and then I was just so just dead tired, man. When you when you called me earlier that morning, I didn't ever go back to sleep, and I fell asleep in the woods there at the end of the hunt, and, and I got home, and I just crashed. He said, man, I thought you said you didn't kill anything, and I said, I didn't. I killed a lot of time, but I didn't kill anything, and he said, well, the greenfield is destroyed. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, this morning I got up early and was going to go hunt that blind that you were in. And he said, when the sun came up, I saw that the ground was just tore up. I mean, just all over it. And and like I said, we may have a few hogs around here. I don't know, but I've, I've heard tales of it. But he said, I don't know if it was hogs or if the coyotes killed something. He said, but there's this blood on the field. And he said, but it's not, it's not like normal blood. And I said, what do you mean it's not normal blood? He said, he said, you just got to see it. And I was like, man, I'm not coming. I, I got things to do. I'm not coming. He said, man, please come over here and look at this. I need to know what this is. So reluctantly, I get my clothes on and I head over there. I grab my rifle. I grab my pistol. I drive instead of walk. I drive back down the road to where that field is. And he's there. He's on his four wheeler. And the field is just like, I don't know. There was a fight. You could see that there was something happened on that field. I mean, there was plugs of grass pulled up. The dirt was all tore up. And there was, I don't know if it was blood, Vic. It was, it was dark. Not like, not like deer blood or, or, you know, you shoot a deer in the gut and it's dark red. It was like darker red than dark red, like almost black red, dark cherry, black red. And, I put my glove on and I reached down and stuck my finger in it and kind of rubbed my fingers together. And when I did it, it was sticky. Now, I don't know if it was sticky because it had been there for a while, you know, it'd been there overnight, but it was thick and it was dark, dark, dark and almost black. In the light, you could catch red shimmer, but... It was disgusting, and it, it was everywhere, everywhere. 
And he, Mike was like, man, I don't know what happened out here, but whatever it was got slaughtered, man. There's something big. And I was like, yeah, Mike, there is. And that let me know. I might have had a dream that night, but that let me know when I was in the green field that I wasn't dreaming. So I walk over to where these things were, and sure enough, there's a couple of prints. And they were faint. If you didn't know what you were looking for, or if you weren't looking for something, you would have probably missed it. But you could see almost like pads, not like a heel. And and when I saw the Alpha, or what I think was the Alpha, she wasn't standing on a foot. It was like, it was almost like a dog foot, but almost kind of bouncing. Not, I mean, does that make sense? Like her, she doesn't have a defined heel touching the ground. One thing I did leave off about the way they look, their arms look like they would be longer than their, like longer than their knees, but they never like drop their arms. They were kind of, they were kind of bowed, like almost, almost like they had their arm up bent at the elbow and kind of limp, limp wristed, if that makes sense. Both of them just kind of, their arms just kind of hanging, both arms hanging, their fingers kind of dangling. They had claws, but they weren't like super duper long or anything like that. Like you could see them, but their fingers, oh my God, their fingers were just, I feel like I got pretty long fingers. You know, I'm six two. Their fingers and hands were twice the size of mine. So Mike says, I mean, I don't know what this is, man. And I said, look, dude, I got, I got to go. I got to go, man. I, my wife has got some stuff for us to do with the kids. I've got to go. He was like, well, okay, bud, you know, you sure you're okay? And I was like, yeah. He was like, well, I think I'm going to hunt the rest of the day. And I was like, Mike, do me a favor, man. Don't hunt today. And he was like, man, it's prime rut time. Why, why wouldn't I hunt? Today? I was like, Mike, please, man, please just, I said, I had a bad dream last night and I, and I lied. I told him, I said, it involved you and, and something happened. And I said, if you don't mind, man, and, and I said, it probably just had to do with you calling me through the night and I was thinking about you. I said, please, if you do, do me a favor, just don't hunt today. And he was like, okay, man, that's cool. I, I won't. I got some things to do anyway. So we went back to the house and that was it. I didn't tell anybody anything up until my kids and I joke about Bigfoot and things like that. And even though I believe they could be out there, I was sharing a, an encounter that I had had when I was a kid that I didn't share tonight. But if you ever want to know it, I'll tell you with my, son and my cousin's son which is my second cousin but they're real close they're about the same age they're born about the same time they're a year apart and his father and i were really close growing up like i don't have any biological brothers but he i consider him my biological brother like i was at his house seven days a week or he was at mine seven days a week it's just the way we were we were inseparable he and he had a brother we were we were all three real close but I was telling them a story about something that I had seen when I was a kid. And I had mentioned it earlier that if you ask my mom and my sister, they would tell you the same story almost verbatim. And we got on the subject of Bigfoot. And that's how I ran across Dogman Encounters. And when I did, like, I was shook. Shook to the core. Like, I thought for sure that my stepdad and I were the only two people that had ever seen this. I just, I, I didn't know what to think. So I started listening and... There's a viewer named Brandon that the first encounter I'd ever heard was a viewer. I think his name was Brandon in upstate New York somewhere. And he comes home and there's scratches on his house. His wife's talking about his cattle being pinned up. And he and his neighbor, I think his neighbor's name was Gene. I've listened to the story a couple of times. They, they take off an ATV and they come up on this dog man. And, and what he's describing is not exactly what I saw, but it's what I saw. This thing has the same pointy ears. The same smile or grin. I mean, I knew instantly. And then there's a story. It was like three hours of Dogman Tales. And I'm laying in the bed at midnight listening to this. I shouldn't have because it had me all like paranoid. I couldn't sleep. had to work the next day. Three hours of Dogman Tales. And there's a lady that she talks. She describes a goose gun. I don't know if that brings remembrance to you or not, Vic. But she's talking about that and and seeing them. And, and it just really just kind of brought all of that back to me. Here we are 10 years later. And, uh, I haven't talked to Mike, like we kept in touch over the years since 2011, but I haven't talked to him, talked to him in at least a year. Um, he and Stephanie have gone through a divorce and, um, we just, I didn't want to go back to the property anymore. Um, he couldn't understand. We didn't really have a falling out, but I pretty much told him, Hey, look, dude, anything down there that's 
hunting related stands, blinds, you can have them. I'm done hunting. And he's tried to convince me several times to not give up. And man, I don't know what happened. I don't know what you saw. I don't know what you experienced. Did something happen? And, and I always just kind of like put him off. And it's like, no, Mike, nothing happened, man. I just lost my passion. Uh, I've, I've chased bucks for years and I've had my opportunities and I've let them walk because we, we're concert. We try to be conservationists. We try to be conservative in what we shoot. Acorn are better outside its ears. I've let some deer. I've never killed a buck. I've shot at a couple. Um, when I was younger, I've let some bucks go that I probably should have killed being that I've never killed a buck. But in my mind, I'm thinking they'll be bigger next year. So I'm going to, I'm going to let them go. And, and I just told him, I said, man, you know, you know how that is. I've chased them and chased the bucks and have never got to a place to where I felt comfortable shooting one. And I said, I've just lost my drive, lost my passion. So in doing so, he and I kind of lost contact. Like I said, we would talk every now and then. And as texting became more readily available, you know, he'll text every now and then. I'd text him. Well, about a month ago, I ran into him in a local grocery store. And it's the first time I've seen him. I'd heard about him and his wife splitting up. And uh, he's got his boy there with him. I haven't seen his boy in years. He was just a couple years old at the time. And I'm talking about how big he is. And, and do you remember me? And he's like, no, Ryan, I don't I don't remember you. And he's like, I used to be at your house all the time. Me and your, your dad were inseparable, especially during hunting season. And we're catching up. And he's like, man, he said, I need you to come back and hunt with me. He said, I can't get anybody that will do what I ask as far as coming out at the right time and, and doing the, the things I want to do, they, they won't come help me work. They won't help me plant, but they all want to hunt, but they won't put the time and effort in. And I was like, well, man, I said, let me think about it. He said, well, I'll tell you what, he said, uh, little Mike and I have been going fishing and bow fishing a lot. He said, it's getting that time. The river's getting down. There's some good spots. Let's go. And I was like, man, I don't know. I'll think about it. And my son's there and he's like, dad, I want to go. Now we, he, he's really got, in, got into wanting to hunt the last year or two. And, and we've gone some places that I know I feel are safe. There's houses around like in people's backyards that have a good bit of property, but the woods are close to their house and they've got blinds set up. We'll go sit in those, but we won't, I, I won't take him deep in the woods. Like I just, I'm out. It's not happening. I'm sitting outside in the dark right now. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to make it happen though. Um, I just, I, I, we don't stay till dark. We don't go until the sun's up. It's just, that's just the way it is. Even though every time I've seen these things, they've been in the daylight, which is crazy to me because I'm so scared of what's out there in the dark, but I'll go out in the daytime. So Mike and I are talking and my son's like, well, dad, I just got my bow and, and I really want to shoot at something that's moving, something other than the target that's in the backyard. And I was like, okay. So we go buy him a bow fishing rig and we get set up and uh, the first weekend of this month, which is June, I call Mike up and I'm on a Friday night and I'm like, Hey man, we're going to come tomorrow if you're not busy and we're going to bow fish. And he was like, excellent. He said, My, little Mike and I are, had planned on going anyway. Um, let's do it. So we get there nine and 11 o'clock in the morning. We eat. And, uh, after we eat, we head down the road to the river bottom and I'm getting a little spooked, but I'm trying to put it in the back of my mind. I'm not thinking much about it. We get down to the river and we're just having a good time, man. We're, we're shooting fish all by my son. <laughs> He's missing everything he shoots and her shoots at. And, uh, we've, we've shot a couple of fish and like I say, we eat what we shoot. We don't, we don't believe in shooting something. If you're not going to eat it, if there's not a purpose behind it, we don't just do it for sport. We don't trophy hunt. We don't trophy fish. We catch and release or even to the point if, if we foul hook a, a fish and it gets in its gills and it's bleeding, that's automatically no matter what size. It's a keeper. We're going to take it home. We'll fillet it. We'll eat it because it's going to die. And, and I don't want its life to be lost for no reason just because I'm out having a good time. You know what I mean? So like I say, we've shot a few fish and thrown them up on the bank. And my son is probably 15 yards to my left. Mike and his boy are probably 15 yards to my right. And we're in this S bend in the river. The way the, the S bend is, is, um, the way it, the way it runs, there's land behind us, but it's almost like the land in front of us 
is behind us because of the way the river runs. But if you take a step back, if you get up on the bank, you're on the opposite side. If that makes any sense to you, I'm trying to trying to describe it. But so we're in this, I don't know, 50, 60 foot pocket between two sandbars and we hear this splash. And I didn't think a lot about it because I'm, I've got my eye on a fish and I look at Mike and he's doing his thing. And all of a sudden my son says, dad, and it's kind of low. And he's like, say 15 yards away from me, dad, dad. And I'm like, what son, what? And he says, wolves. And I, I had to process what he was thinking for a minute. I said, wolves, what does wolves mean? And I look up and there they are. There's four of them. They've got us dead to rights. There's one below Mike and his boy, one directly in front of me, one directly in front of my son. And the way, the way the river turns, the two on the end, the one that's beside Mike is kind of behind them, the way the river turns, one in front of me, one in front of my son. And the way the river turns again, it's kind of behind my son, like off his left shoulder. And I'm looking at these things and Mike, about that time, he looks up and he sees them too. And, and we're both carrying pistols. I've got a, a 40 cal Smith and Wesson and he's got a 1911 45 on his side. And I see him reach for his pistol and I said, don't. And when I said that, the one in front of me stood up and it was male. I didn't see what we call the alpha. I just see four jet black wolves. And I, and I sent you some pictures last night of, of some wolves or, or wolf slash dogs that are on all fours. That's what they look like, but massive. They're five foot tall at their back, four and a half foot tall at their back. I mean, they are massive. Ever bit of 300 pounds. 250, 300 pounds, I would estimate. I mean, they are, they're bigger than me. I'm 220 pounds, six foot two. And their backs, where they're standing, look like they would hit me in the chest almost. And the one that's in front of me stands up. And as he stands up, he reaches up with his hand, not his paw, but his hand. And he grabs a limb right at the base of where it connects to the tree and just props up. And just kind of hangs there. And he's looking at us. And Mike, I see out of the corner of my eye, even though I had said don't, pulls his pistol out. And when he did, they all showed their, showed their teeth. They didn't growl. They didn't howl. They were close enough to hear them breathing. I mean, heavy labored breathing. And that one's just standing there chilling with his hand on this on this branch, just kind of almost swaying back and forth. And while the other ones, I'm, I'm catching glimpses out of the corners of my eye. My son's making his way toward me. Mike has grabbed his boy and pulled him in close. I can see their teeth and the one in front just kind of grins. Just, he, he wasn't showing his teeth, but he smiled like, I've got you. You're bait. You are dinner. I've got you. Right here, right now. And I look over at Mike and I'm like, put the gun away. Don't move. I know what these are. And he's like, you know what they are. And he's raising his voice. And I'm like, Mike, Mike, just calm down. Don't move. Just don't move. My son's crying. And then all of a sudden, the one that's standing up roars. And we get that same, all, all four of us have the same experience as what I had the night that I saw the alpha, the male and the white thing. As it roars, we get sick, like dizzy, nauseated. My son actually throws up. Mike's boy's crying. My son's crying. And as soon as, as that happens, which seems like an eternity, it was just a matter of seconds that it all happened. It's like time. It's almost like I don't ever been in a car wreck. I was in a car wreck when I was a teenager. And as I remember back, I don't remember being knocked out at the moment, but as I've gotten older and think back to that moment, it's almost like time slowed down. I can remember everything about that wreck, but it's all in slow motion. That's the way this is. It's like time actually stopped almost, slowed down. 
and I'm moving, looking, everything else is kind of frozen with the exception of the dog men or the coyotes or wolves, whatever they are. My son is even, when he's moving towards me, is moving real slow, which in reality, he says he ran to me, lets out this roar, we get sick, time slowing down. As we come out of it, we look up and they're gone. Just gone. We never heard them. The way that they would have come in, they would have had to come down an embankment, like come down almost, it's really a bluff, but it's a, it's a gradual, steep bank, but gradual coming down. And surely we would have heard them crunch something, uh, a branch or leftover leaves from the fall. I mean, there was still foliage, like, like dead leaves still on the ground. Uh, there was a lot of green foliage. You could see like the trees were growing out of the banks and the branches were high. You could see up that hill and we never saw them. We never heard them other than that splash. Now, I don't know if one of them had, had jumped the, the crossing and landed in the water. I don't know. I don't know what the splash was. We make it back to the truck. I take my son home. I tell Mike on the way, like he won't even talk about it. His son's crying. My son's crying. And the only thing he would say is, I didn't see what we saw. That was, they, those were coyotes. He'd tell little Mike, those are coyotes. Those are coyotes. Those are coyotes. Wouldn't talk about it. And I said, let me take my son home. I'll be back. When I get back, I'll tell you what happened. So I get back and I said, come on, we got to go back down to the river. He's like, I'm not going back down there. I, I'll sell this place. I, I'm, I'm going to sell it anyway. It's up for sale. It's done. It's said that I'm never going down there again. I'm like, Mike, come on, man. Let's go down there. So we go back down there. And where we were at, where the splash came from, was in the same area we were in. And you could see the bottom. There were no sticks floating. There were no logs. There were no rocks in the bottom. It was just sandy, silty bottom with fish. Could have been a fish that jumped. I don't know. I don't think so, though. I know my son hadn't shot. Mike hadn't shot. I hadn't shot. His son doesn't have a bow. He just goes. So I think they threw something in the water to startle us. I don't know. But we looked. Didn't see anything. I go to that tree. And I raise my hand up to where it was. Like I said, I'm 6'2", and its head is almost at that branch. It's got its arm up on it easily, and I can barely touch it with my fingertips. So it was a good seven, eight feet off the ground, and its head is nearly touching it. And when they stand up, they're not standing upright. They're they're kind of haunched, kind of haunched over, almost humpback ish and their arms are constantly just kind of draping in front of them. Their hands kind of limp at the wrist, and uh, we can't figure it out. So since I talked to you earlier this week, I called Mike, and I asked him, I said, man, I'm going to do this show. I'm going to tell our story. I don't know if the guy's an expert, but I know he's got over 250, 300 accounts at least on his website, and I'm going to try to get some answers. Do you want to come and talk to him? And he was like, no, no. I don't, I don't, those were coyotes. Um, I sold the house. He said, uh, I had somebody who was interested in it. I made him a deal on it. I sold them. And, and Mike's pretty wealthy. He and his dad have a construction business and they build subdivisions and, um, they make a lot of money doing it too. I mean, they like, they have money and he's been thinking about moving to the lake anyway. And he said, I sold the house. I had a guy, I told him I'd make him a good deal on it. But the only stipulation was, was he couldn't hunt the property. I'm going to keep the property. I'm going to sell the two acres, which his house sits on the backside of his two acre house place, which was, you know, his grass that he mows. He said, that's the only thing I'm selling. And I'm going to high fence from the road all the way across the front of the property to the river bottom. And I said, high fence. He said, yep. He said, I've, I've, I've got the money. I'm going to do it. And you're talking probably a hundred acres, Vic, that a fence, you know? And he said, he said the, the couple's an older couple. They don't have any children. They don't have any grandchildren. They really love the property. He said, I had to drop the price because I told him that he couldn't hunt it. If he wanted to shoot deer that are in the yard, he's welcome to do that. But there is no going onto the property outside of the two or so acres where the fence line is. You cannot like, you cannot go on it. He said, I've gone, he's got security cameras up and stuff around his house. He said, I've gone and bought extra deer cameras. I'm going to put them out in strategic places. And he said, just keep an eye out. He said, but I know what I saw. It was coyotes only. And I said, well, Mike, 
if it was coyotes only, why are you so paranoid? And he said, well, I'm not paranoid. He said, I just don't want nobody hunting my property. I said, Mike, you can deny it all you want, brother. But I'm telling you, I know what it was. I dealt with him when I was a kid, and I told him the story. And he's just, he shook like he's white. And he's like, well, why are they on my property? I said, well, if you think about it, Mike, your property joins ours. It's separated by the road. So I said, you know, wolves, I've, I've done some reading up on wolves and things like that. And they can travel in a day. They can travel up to 30 miles looking for food. I said, you know, it's a 10 mile drive from my house to yours from the property as a crow flies. I can be on your property in five minutes or less and at your house and, and at least that, if not eight to 10 minutes. I said, so why wouldn't they be here? I said, I think it's just their territory. I think they, they travel back and forth. And, you know, I told him the story about what happened that night and, and whenever I, I passed out or whatever. And I said, I said, maybe they don't go back to, to pop side of the property because of him shooting them. I don't know. I said, but there's a good food source here. There's, there's deer here. And I said, if that white thing is what they hunt, there is obviously presence of that around. I, I, I don't know, Mike. I don't have the answer. I said, but you know, I can try to get them. I can try to help you. And he's just like, man, I don't, I don't even care. I just got an agreement with the guy. I'm going to close on the house in a month. In the meantime, I'm taking some work off. Me and dad, we're going to put the fence up. We're going to get it along the property line where the roads are and there'll be gates and nobody can go in or out. There'll be cameras at the gates. I'll know. I'll get signaled if something comes. So he's pretty shook. He won't talk about it. He, he told me he never wanted to talk about it again. I said, well, what about little Mike? He said, I told him they were wolves and that it was just propped up stretching on the tree and he's over it. He hadn't said another word about it. And I said, well, what about Stephanie? Is he going to tell Stephanie? He said, I told Stephanie that it was just coyotes and they were just really big. And the only way that little Mike would process it was that they were wolves. And that's what he thinks. He just doesn't ever want to go down there again. And we're not going to, we'll find somewhere else to hunt. And he said, I just want to make sure that nobody else is on that property unless they're there on their own free will. And I said, well, did you tell the man and woman that's buying the house? He said, nope. He said, I just told him you're not allowed to hunt my property. And if you are hunting on my property, you will be slapped with a no trespassing agreement. And he said that that'll be the end of it. So that's, uh, that's my story, Vic. I don't know what you think. I don't know if I'm crazy. Um, you know, my, my son's had a rough time sleeping lately since that encounter, since that happened. Um, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't go through the house at night unless he puts on a light. We've got a big screened in porch and, and French doors and you can see outside. He, he won't go in the living room where that's at. I won't look out the window. And I, and I've been this way for years. But if I go through the living room, I may not turn the lights on, but I do not look out the door. Like I will not look to see what's outside. My wife knows a little bit about it. She, I think she believes us. And, and really the only reason she believes us is because my son. Um, but she's still convinced that maybe we didn't see exactly what we saw, even though I've told her the whole story. And like I said, my stepdad, Pop, he's, uh, he's since passed away. He passed away about four or five years ago. Uh, there's nobody to back my story up when I was a kid, you know? Um, and she's got a story that it's, it's far fetched, but it's not supernatural or anything like that that we make fun of her because there's no witness to it other than her dad and her dad's kind of crazy. So, uh, we make fun of her and she's like, well, you say I didn't do what I did. So there's no way this happened to you. So, you know, I really don't know what she thinks. I know it's in the back of her mind. I know she wants my son to get over it, but I guess time will tell. I, I know a little rough sleep in the past couple of nights for me, just, I guess, anticipation of doing the show, the recent encounter, us talking about it, you know, brings up a lot of emotions and a, a lot of what ifs, you know, did I really see what I saw? No, I know I saw what I saw. Is this thing really real? Should I tell more people that they need to know? Just a lot of, a lot of questions. Am I doing the right thing? You know, and, 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 and man, I love people. Like I believe people, I, I believe we're there to help one another. And, and I believe in doing the right thing. My granddaddy always told me, he said, son, he said, the right thing is the right thing. No matter how much it sucks, no matter how much it hurts you, no matter how much it hurts the other person, the right thing is the right thing. And you'll be able to sleep at the end of the night. So that's my big struggle is, is, is the right thing to tell people and get ridiculed and not worry about it? Or is the right thing to just remain quiet and see if anybody else has, has had any encounters? I, to my knowledge, I don't know. Other than what I read on Facebook today, I don't, I don't know if that's what it was. That's what I think it was. Like I said, it's within, you know, five miles of here. So it's a good possibility, but 
I don't know. That's, I don't know, man. That's every thought, everything I can recall, everything I can think of. I just, I like I said, I got a lot of questions, man. Um, and I may never have answers to them. You know what I mean? I, I may never have answers to them, but if I don't, I know the Lord's on my side and, and I'm good to go. My family's on my side. They don't think I'm crazy, whether they fully believe. I know my son does. I'm not telling my two girls ever unless they encounter it themselves and hopefully they won't. But yeah, that's it, man. It's funny how the more you find out about dog men, the more questions you have. It really never ends. But having said that, we're out of time, Ryan. Before we get out of here, do you have any closing comments you'd like to share? Man, Vic, I would just say to anybody out there who wants to see one of these things, don't. It wouldn't be, uh, as, as President Bush used to say, or, or the guy on Saturday Night Live, it wouldn't be prudent. It's not prudent. Um, I, I, I wouldn't go searching for them. I mean, like I said, maybe your cojones are bigger than mine. Um, and you know, I mean, those things had me dead to rights a couple of times. You know what I mean? It, it, they, if they had wanted me, they had me, you know what I mean? They had me, but they definitely did want me to know they were there. I don't know if they were just trying to scare me or if they're trying to impart some sort of knowledge. I, I don't know, man. I, I don't know. They're definitely quiet. Um, they will be on you before you know it. So, you know, to anybody who's going out there searching for them or even Sasquatch or aliens or whatever, you know, if it's not human, you don't know what you're dealing with. So I, I would say don't fool with it, man. I would just let sleeping dogs lie. If, if you do see it, talk to somebody about it, call you or whatever you need to do, but don't go seeking them out. It's, I just, I, once you see it, man, you can't see it. You just can't. That's true. Be careful what you wish for. Well, Ryan, I can't thank you enough for coming on and sharing all those experiences with us. I really do appreciate it. Man, I appreciate you listening to me, man. I really do. It's, and like I say, it's good to get off your chest. It's good to know there's somebody out there like-minded that, that thinks these things are real. Or, or I say you think they're real. You wouldn't do what you do if you didn't have some sort of speculation about it. You know, I don't know your encounters or, or whatever has happened in your life to even get you in this field, but... It's just good to know that there's others out there that are seeing them and, and have had experiences like I've had. And, and we'll see, man. I guess you don't know what the future holds, but you just keep God on your side and do the right things. And I guess it works out, you know. That's right. If you hang in there and don't give up, things normally do work out. Ryan, thanks again so much. Have a great night. If you've had a dog me an encounter of your own and would like to speak with me, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you.